Hello and welcome to the second episode of the podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. This episode was brought to you by 420australia.org. Be sure to use the discount code, the podcast, all one word, to get a special 5% off discount at the checkout. As well as Lucky Dog Seeds, who you can expect to see some amazing Chem 91 crosses from in the near future. In this episode, we're joined by Skunk VA, who was kind enough to give us some in-depth history on the scene, as well as a killer recount of how he came to acquire the 91 cutting, his general plans for the future, and some general thoughts on the scene. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome our next guest onto the show, Skunk VA. You know, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Right on, thanks for having me. Um, and so before we get into it, um, I'm just going to basically remind everyone that for this interview, we're going to refer to the man chem dog as mass G or just G, um, and the strain as chem dog or the 91 or the VA cutting, um, just so we can hopefully avoid some confusion because that's something which comes up a lot when talking about this type of stuff. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is, um, for this interview, I think kind of the most fitting way to start it would be to actually kind of start at the middle and then go back to the start, just so that people kind of have an understanding of where you fit into the whole scene. So, okay. so far, the story online seems to be um, what I gather pretty inaccurate, but this is how it goes. Essentially, you met Mass G online on Overgrown. The two of you chatted, became friends. You ended up trading clones. Uh, you got the 91 off him and he got the skunk from you or the super skunk. Um, some years later, Kem got raided. Um, he lost his clones. Uh, eventually, you guys met back up and you gave him the 91 back. And here we are a few years later. How accurate is that story in general? There's definitely pieces of that that add up or, or that are true, but that's not really the timeline. Uh, I didn't meet G until 2006. Uh, I got the chem dog in, in 1995, uh, a few days before Jerry Garcia died in, August, in July of 1995. Rest in peace, Jerry. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a big week. I'm going to see, uh, going to McLaurin Park tomorrow in San Francisco. It's uh, Jerry Garcia Day at the amphitheater. That's actually called Jerry Garcia Amphitheater. I'm pretty excited about it. But yes, rest in peace, Jerry. And thanks for everything out there, of course. But um, so what happened was, I'm just going to start from the beginning. Um, yeah, go for it. How I came, how I came into the chem dog. It was, uh, you know, I'm from Virginia originally, and uh, lots of us people, lots of us young folks from uh, Virginia, my age, we ended up on Grateful Dead tour because that's what was going on in America at the time. You know, like 1988, 1989, 1990. Seems like every time they passed through, they would take a whole other wave of us with them, you know. And uh, and for some reason, when you were on tour, there was a lot of people from Virginia. I can't really explain it to you, but there was a lot of people from Virginia for some reason. And um, I found myself following the Grateful Dead around and, and uh, pretty much left Virginia to do that. It was kind of a full-time thing for me. And what that means is, you know, of course, there's not a show every night. and There's not a, sh- you know, a tour going on constantly. There's three or four tours a year. And then a bunch of other Jerry Garcia band or Grateful Dead shows that you would, or uh, um, Jerry Garcia band shows that you might catch. And those were always centered around San Francisco um, in the early 90s. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, in between tours, you would find yourself in the Bay Area, um, California, um, you know, waiting around for the next show, basically. And, and you know, one of the ways that we would kind of put food in our mouths and, uh, and, uh, you know, when, when, when you were at the Grateful Dead show, it was really easy to make money. Money was in the air. I mean, anybody who's, you know, 35 or 40 or older knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, but between shows, life could get kind of hard. And, you know, I found myself in San Francisco hanging around the Panhandle Park. And um, back then, of course, marijuana was very difficult to find at times, especially in the summertime before harvest. And uh, there just wasn't the type of indoor volume going on, you know, as we have today, obviously. And, you know, pot prices could be anywhere from, you know, 400 to $450 for a weight ounce. And to get a weight ounce for that price, you were, you were getting hooked up by your friend, you know. So what we would do is we would get ounces and we would break them into what we called hates, which were like 2.8 grams and get a couple little extra ones out of there and then basically find customers in the park who were honestly 80% of those people were, were ill. You know, you could see sometimes that more than often that there was something going on with them and that's where they would come. And there was a shady transaction every time because the, you know, selling marijuana was a felony and it was, we were just 
kids in the park. It was we were like, you know, fish in a barrel, if you know what I mean. And uh, basically, um, that's what was going on. So I was down there. And when I was growing up in Virginia, we smoked stuff like the Super Skunk. It was called the 86 Super Skunk later on, which it was also later called the Mass Skunk, the Mass Super Skunk. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But um, so we, the things that we were growing were a lot of things out of the, uh, the uh, Super Sativa Seed Bank catalog um, uh, from you know, he, he put, I don't know when those started coming out, but but uh, I've got a few of them uh, digitally archived. I'm really happy about that because they had the numbers and what they were. And that was the fellow who went all around the world and, you know, buddied up with people in, in, the, in the Kush Mountains in Afghanistan or, or Africa or, you know, even the United States. And somehow he had this network of breeders all over the world. And I think in Virginia, that was probably one of his seed producers because, you know, we always seemed like we always had like the cream of the crop of what the stuff was coming out of this, out of this, uh, catalog. And there was some even, uh, for instance, the Beatrix choice, which is, was always my favorite before I left my hometown. And it was very rare. It was like the Holy grail, you know, it was like, Oh my God, you got a bag of Beatrix choice. And even in the catalog, I think in the 87 version, he actually mentioned Central Virginia. So, but anyway, um, so yeah, in between, so 90, like, I think it was, it was, it must've been January of 1993. I was in the park and I was kind of always away from the crowd. I was kind of a, I don't know, kind of more, I was, I didn't like doing this kind of thing. It made me very uncomfortable, but this is kind of what we did to, you know, to, to make it get a hotel that night, get a floor space that night, get us some food in our belly, whatever, you know, just kind of make it to the next day so we can, you know, be around when the next show start. And, uh, basically, uh, I was sitting on the bench and this guy comes walking down. I'll never forget this moment. It was a big moment in my life and I knew it at the time, but this guy comes walking down the sidewalk and, uh, and he's got this grin on his face. He's got a ponytail and he comes walking. He's got me locked in his eyes and he comes walking through the panhandle. And he he walks right up to me. I knew I was like, this guy either really, really needs a sack of weed or maybe, maybe just maybe he's got one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he did. He offered me, he goes, Hey, and he had a heavy, heavy New York accent. And, uh, we started talking and he didn't waste any time. And he, and he, I asked him, I said, Hey, uh, you, do you need a sack of weed or something? And, uh, he says, actually, bro, I was going to ask you. And this guy has like the quintessential heaviest net New York accent. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And I just knew. So, cause he had that, he had that look, I had growers all over the nation. You know, I, everywhere we went, you would look for those familiar faces. The guy you saw somewhere in that area last time, you know, in the little, you know, set of shows four or five or six in the Ohio area. You'd see this guy, you know, maybe even don't even remember his name, but you know, his face and he's always got the kill. And when you were on tour, that was really a big part of your day was you had to make some money. You had to get a ticket for the show. And these are not necessarily in this order because the ticket always came first and you had to find yourself some head stash. And it was, the head stash was always the most challenging part. And if you were like me and you didn't really have your own ride, you had to find a ride to the next show, you know? Yeah. So anyway, so he, we started talking and he goes, listen, man, I just moved out here from New York city in Sonoma County and my electricity is getting ready to get turned off tomorrow. I don't know anybody. I moved out here, me and my girlfriend from, um, well, Staten Island. And you know, if you could help me, it would be, I would really appreciate it. And I was just like, dude, you have no idea. I think we're going to help each other both, you know, mutually a lot right now. So what do you got? And so he takes me back. We walk back to his van and he's got one of those, he's got one of those extended, you know, like when you see an extended van, like one of the big old cargo vans and it had like the line at the back of the van where you could see where they, they extended it to get the extra three or four feet. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. line, this van actually had another line with another set of two feet, you know, behind it. This thing was like 17, 18 feet long. It was the biggest van I've ever seen. <laughs> And we're parked, he's parked like on a pretty sharp hill in San Francisco and we get in there and he's like, I'm like, well, first off, you know, man, how much, how much are you going to be, you know, how much would you sell this to me for? And like I mentioned, cannabis, marijuana, it was going for $450 an ounce that day from your buddy. And, and, and you had to wait for him to get up. You had to wait for him to get down to the street. It was a nightmare. 
And and also you had to divvy it out because everybody needed a little bit. It wasn't like you're the first person you got to see and you wanted two ounces. You know, he would just give you one ounce so that make to make sure you had other ounce for you know somebody else, one of his other friends he's going to see. You know, it was always a hassle. And so this was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. You know, and this guy starts pulling out this amazing indoor. I mean, and and the indoor, you know, you would find it down there in the city at that, those days, but it was extremely rare, even in California in the in the early nineties, like this. And it was mostly outdoor, beautiful outdoor. I would say even nicer outdoor than we see these days, but but still, indoor was very rare. And um, he had a strain called Francine. He had a very small amount of Kim Dog. He told me about. And 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 I was very impressed with it. He didn't have any for me to to buy or anything like that. But he had. We smoked a little bit while we were chit chatting and talking about, you know, Grateful Dead and Nugs and all the things you talk about when you meet someone. You know, people kindred people meet like this. You know. Yeah. And uh, he had uh, what else did he have? He had some, oh, he had this other really fluffy one. And by the way, fluffy was the way to go if you could get the fluffy we'd like because it just looks bigger when you're only weighing 2.8 you know grams out <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh or i bulk it out so um and and he was like i was like all right so what what do you want for this and i mean because i'm ready to work i mean if he wants 450 dollars an ounce then we're going to go up to the street and we're going to find everybody who needs some and we're going to sell for 450 bucks an ounce. he goes i don't know do you think 300 would be good and I was like, I almost kissed him. You know what I mean? I was like, yes, I think that would be great. I think that would be perfect. And But you have to do me one favor. You have to stay right here. Don't leave. Like, don't go wandering around. And every single kid that you see with a backpack and a skateboard, don't walk up to him and ask him because, you know, I'm going to, you know, let me take care of this. I would appreciate it, you know. And I'll make sure that, you know, you get your money and you go home and pay your electric bill. And uh, so he's like, no problem, man, no problem. And he brought himself up a few joints, and we we got some books and some other things. We found his van, and we made like a nice little level spot, and we started weighing the nugs up. And so the thing went well all day long. I just kept running back up and forth down the street, and I uh, hope the statute of limitations has run out on that crime, but I think it has. <laughs> and uh, this was, uh, I think, January. I, I, I have a hard time with this particular date and in my own little personal timeline here, because, but I'm pretty sure it was January 1993. And uh, so anyways, I made a pocket full of money and, and a big fat sack of killer indoor head stash. I mean, this guy really had some of the best indoor I'd ever seen so far in my life. And I'd seen quite a bit. I was fortunate enough to see quite a bit. And um, he told me, he goes, man, I, I'm, I'm so appreciative. He was, I was very appreciative, but he was tenfold appreciative. I mean, he was like, I, I, it, it, did, it, it was out of proportion how appreciative he was, and he kept talking about it. And I'm like, man, it's no problem, dude. I was like, I'm going to go sleep in, in down, downtown tonight. I'm not going out to the marina and crashing on the floor. I'm going to go get my own damn room tonight, you know? And uh, so, anyway, um, he said, listen to me. I, ever, I live here because Jerry Garcia plays at the Warfield. That's the whole reason I move out here. I, I don't, you know, California is a dream to me, but I came here to see Jerry Garcia as much as I can. And, you know, just in case anybody doesn't know what that means, like Jerry Garcia at the Warfield was like church to a deadhead. That's that's like that's you get you get you get as close as possible back then. You know, concerts, Grateful Dead concerts were big events, you know, three days at a stadium with 90,000 people in it. You know, no problem sold out and probably another 20,000 people who don't even have tickets. It was a mayhem. So to see Jerry Garcia at a roughly, I think, I think. The Warfield's like twelve to sixteen hundred people, maybe. It's a pretty small theater. It's an old theater in San Francisco. It it was a very special thing, you know. And it, playing his music that he wanted to play us, I mean, it was amazing. And you know, he would play on average there three to six shows every month. It, I think if you average it out, you know, so it was a lot, you know. And uh, they had these tables there, and uh, he he said to me, he goes, "Hey." I have a ta- I, I get up at the morning at, at the crack of dawn at 5 a.m. I go down to the water field. I sit in line. I have a whole group of friends that I know just from sitting in this line just so I can get this table. And if you'd like to come, I will always save you a chair because I'm, I'm just that appreciative. I will always save, save you a chair. You're always welcome to come down. And I was like, wow. sure, man. And I'm sure there was some shows coming up. And, uh, and, he, and so I did. I went down there, and sure enough, the man – he, it was almost like you couldn't wait to see me, you know, and, and uh, I get there 
And that's my spot, you know, for, for the rest of the time that Jerry was alive, I always went and sat that chair next to him. And, um, and then it was, it was an amazing experience just being there because, you know, this guy was quite the networker himself as far as growers around the nation. And when, you know, deadheads travel well, obviously, you know, we go all over the place to see this stuff we did still. And, uh, growers from all over the country would come and they would link up with him and, and come set the table and bring their wares and bring their, their, their ganja, you know, like their, their, their best buds, you know, and Steve Parrish would come from behind the stage. He was Jerry Garcia's tech sound guitar man, probably his bouncer, you know, every, he was everything to Jerry in the professional setting, you know, he was the guy who wiped down Jerry's guitar between set breaks and he would come out. Right. <laughs> and he would smoke with us. And Ramrod came out a couple times that he was visiting to see a Jerry show. He was a uh, another roadie of the Grateful Dead. And Bob Snodgrass and uh, Maria Snodgrass would come out also. They, they're, Bob Snodgrass is the guy who probably blew the very first glass marijuana pipe, you know. And this is why I get the timeline a little confused because it, it, it might – it seemed like back then when we were young, and I probably I would imagine everybody feels this way, but back when we were young, like a month or like a season could seem like a year in, in your memory as you look back in your life. You know, you're like, how could that much stuff happen in my life in that short period of time? As I got older, I've always kind of tripped out on that, you know? Yeah. And so it wasn't too long after I met him, though, and like I said, Jerry was always playing there, that uh, I asked I asked this guy, I said, hey, uh, Hey man, is it okay? My friend, I would tell him about the super skunk. That's what it was. I would tell him about the super skunk. Oh yeah. You know how it is. You're like, yeah, this is nice, but you should see this stuff in my hometown or, you know, it's always like the fish that got away. You know what I mean? I'd tell him about the super skunk and he, he heard about it. He knew about it. You know, he had, like I said, friends all over the place. And he was like, well, you got to get me some, you know, I want to check it out, man. You always talking about the super skunk. So one night or one weekend or a week or whatever, excuse me. Some of the, uh, some of the people that I grew up growing, you know, some of the people that grew the weed that I smoked when I was growing up came out to see Jerry at the Warfield and they linked up with me. And I was like, Hey, I, I'm going to ask my buddy, see if you guys want to come to the table, man. It'd be kind of cool. You know, he, we, we all have an amazing puff session. We have a good time. Let me just ask my friend. So I asked the guy, the table guy, you know, and I said, Hey man, would it be cool if these guys came and you know, they got, they brought some super skunk with them. You get a chance to try it. And he's like, hell yeah, definitely. So, you know, I was just a pretty much a kid. I mean, I was, you know, what, 19 at the time or 20, 21, 21, I guess. And, uh, you know, these guys were grown men, most of them, even the, my, the person I'm talking about with the, the that shared his the seat at the table with me. And, uh, you know, they were all growers and they had their own discussions, you know what I mean? And they started chit chatting. And the thing about people from Virginia, and I don't know if Tommy told you this, or you, man, I guess he lived it. You don't really need to, he doesn't need to tell you, but a harsh place for people who who uh you know are involved with cannabis and any any facet smoking any way i mean it's you can get yourself in a lot of trouble there with the law yeah, and so of course that leads to a culture of a lot of quiet you know reserved you know you, you got to watch who you talk to you've got to really watch your step and keep your business to yourself if you want to you know even just grow some head stash for yourself there and that's how those guys were they didn't talk about with anybody and that even though I, I knew they smoked, they didn't talk about it with me, you know what I mean? And and, and I, I was okay, okay with that because I understood. So I was surprised that they, you know, they opened up to each other and it was cool, you know. And, you know, they came back out for another set of shows. And we got to all know each other over that weekend. And uh, finally, some of the boys from Virginia said to me, they said, hey, listen, your buddy from New York, he, he asked us uh, about if we could get him super skunk cuttings. I was like, oh, yeah, what did you tell him? And he goes, uh, you know, we kind of, we kind of didn't really answer. We wanted to talk to you. How long have you known this guy? And I was like, well, you know, I, I haven't known him very long, but he, you know, I know a lot about him. I know that, you know, he's an all right guy. And, uh, they took my, took my, I felt like they went out on a limb because they took the 21 year old, you know, advice that, Hey, this guy's okay, man. It's okay to talk to him a little bit and get to know him, exchange phone numbers and stuff, which was a really big deal. I mean, today it seems silly to think about that, but. It was a really big deal at the time. And so they did, and, uh, you know, quick, quick order, you know, the action went, went, went into process, and, and uh, what the plan was was he was going to bring a couple of cuttings out from uh, Sonoma County, fly them out to New York, 
where he's from and get a couple of chem dog cuttings. And he was going to meet them. They were going to drive up from Virginia with some super skunk cuttings, a couple. And then, uh, and then make an exchange and they were going to take the chem dog back to Virginia. Or I think, you know what, thinking back, I, I think they were actually going for this thing he had called the Francine. It was, I don't, I haven't seen it in years. It was the only one that ever showed it. It was really nice. It was beautiful. It was like a Northern lights kind of thing. And, um, they really liked it. And that's the one they wanted. And, uh, when he went back there, he uh, got a couple of chem dog cuttings. This is in 1993 still. It had to be 1993. And, uh, and he, took a, he went back and, and got a couple of chem dogs lo- locally from that area. And uh, he was tied into that whole chem dog family that was there. They used to grow chem dog in apartments using Peters and had these killer like 10 pound harvest from just a few flights, you know, and they would sell, the, they would sell the stuff in central park for $800 an ounce. And it was legendary. You know what I mean? It, it was crazy, but he was tied into that, to that crowd. So somehow he got some chem dog cuttings and then they came up with the super skunk and they made an exchange. And then in order to kind of pay whoever helped him out, he gave them a super skunk cutting there. And then, so he brought back the chem dog and the super skunk back to the West coast, the guy, the New York guy, right? Yeah. So that's how he got out here. And that's that was the trade that, that eventually, as far as I know, and the way I understand it, is that's where the mass skunk became the mass skunk, was that super skunk cutting that came up from Virginia, right? Yeah. So, and then I don't know all this, because I wasn't there for that. You know, I, had to, I know that's what happened because, you know, I knew all the people involved, but I don't know what happened to super skunk 100%. But I definitely have seen pictures of the mass super skunk, and without a doubt, that's the mass skunk. I mean, I'm sorry, the super skunk, the 86 yeah. Super Sativa C Club super skunk, without a doubt. It was the most distinctive bud because it always had this one little pregnant belly that would pop off on not all around the bud, but only on one side. And not necessarily on the side the light was on, but only on one side. And if you look at it, it's a, um, in that 86 catalog or the 87, one of the two, it's very distinct, that picture. It looks exactly like the seed that was popped where I grew up, and it was the same one that they called the mask on. That I saw later on. I mean, all this stuff, you know, I like to say that, like, you know, back then, like, of course, we didn't really have cell phones. We had Sky Pagers was the brand new thing where you could get a page anywhere in the United States. It was cutting-edge revolutionary, you know what I mean? But there was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was no email. There was no cell phones, obviously. I mean, it, it's amazing what the Grateful Dead did to connect people around the United States and, and to, you know, keep these things alive that were trying to be stamped out by the government at, at the height of the drug war in the United States. I mean, it's just, it can't, it can never be like overemphasized, like how much that community had a role in making sure that cannabis kept evolving through those years, those dark years in the United States, you know? Well, that was actually and, and without. Sorry, I was going to say that was going to be uh, the next question I was going to actually ask was, you know, at, at the end of the day, how much do you think the Grateful Dead did influence the cannabis scene? You know, like when I look at it, I tend to think that if they weren't around, you could almost argue that, you know, like none of this would exist in terms of, you know, I mean, you'd have your skunk number one in that. But, you know, in terms of the chem dog and all the OG cushion, everything that's delineated out from it, it just wouldn't exist. Do you agree? I totally agree. It's no doubt about it. I mean... Anybody my age or older or even younger, a little bit younger, knows that, you know, it had, there was nothing going on in America like this. I mean, there was nothing going on. I mean, the, the drug war had a, a huge, when I, and I act like it's over, it's not over, but it's definitely, we're on the other side of it now. It's waning now. Like, our side has now made its case that, hey, man, you know, you're destroying people's lives. You're taking people's family and crushing them, and, and it's just for a plant. I mean, we're definitely got America. We've definitely got America's attention now about what an atrocity occurred during those years. But you know, from from the nineteen seventy, from the early seventies, when this whole when they basically scheduled drugs in the United States and put cannabis in the Schedule One category, meaning it has no medical value whatsoever, and they still look at it to that day. You know, all the way through until basically until nine eleven, I would even say, because I think maybe that took a lot of the resources away from the drug war. I mean, it was dark in America. It was hard. Like, you, you had to really be committed to these types of things. It was no, 
you know, there was no, you didn't take these things lightly. Cause I mean, if you did, you were playing with fire and, and you know, you really were, could be find yourself in for a big surprise, you know? And there's a, there's one, there's one saying, you know, as far in grateful dead land is that the, in the land of darkness, the, the, the carriage of the, uh, well, with the, in the land of darkness, the carriage of light is drawn by the grateful dead. You know, that's kind of <laughs> what it was like, you know? Yeah. They literally their mission their their mission from the get go was to go into the darkest corners of the United States and the world, but really the United States because this was this is about this this band and this culture was about America. It was about you know where, where's the freedom you know like where's the adventure that we all read about like is it over and we're just we're just spectators of the past you know like it, it just it was right now and it was happening and it was it was they took this circus into every dark corner of this country and they found kids like myself who were just like really this is it this is your freedom that i've been getting taught about in fourth grade this is bullshit you know like they really that's and then when i say they i'm not talking about a guy playing a guitar i'm talking about the whole thing i'm talking about me everybody who was part of that you know and the movement and the band of course was the catalyst and and people who put it all on the line because of what they believed and that's really what it boiled down to it was never about money it was never about it was just about you know i don't really know what it was about it was about just trying to make a more free world where you can be yourself you know and i think that's i think that cannabis played it was a big part of that you know i think that was just a it was all it was a you know, it was in the background, but it was also in the foreground. It was a big part of that, you know. I mean, that's that's where growers met each other. That's where you learned. That's where you met a guy in the park. You know, that's how you meet a guy in the park in San Francisco when you're 21 who's eventually going to give you the chem dog. That's how it worked, you know. Yeah. And so, anyways, I'm sorry if I'm getting sidetracked a little bit. Yeah, no, it's not a problem. So, getting back to the story, um, just to clarify, because I think some people may not have picked up on it. When you said uh, the New York guy, that's how he got the super skunk. That's uh, Mass G you're referring to, right? No, no, no. This this guy, I'm going to leave this guy's name out of it for now because I haven't talked to him about, you know, talk. Yeah, He's, no, uh, that's, that's no problem. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify for everyone. So, yeah, so our New York friend has got the super skunk now. Yeah. And so, and, and, I, and he, like I said, he brought one cutting back to the West Coast and he, to him, with him, so because that's what you know he's doing it for and then he left one with the people his friends in new york right yeah and then eventually that got up to massachusetts as the story goes that that eventually got up to massachusetts and i think i think g has talked a little bit about that I, i'm not sure uh he could probably tell you more about like what how did that get from staten island let, let's go ahead and say staten island up to where he was i mean he was tied in with those folks because they, their whole thing was the chem dog. So I don't know how, how he was connected to those. Cause I didn't, to those guys, I just don't know, you know? Yeah. Like I said, I'd never met that guy until 2006. So I want, and then going forward from there. So he brings it back and he's like, man, you know, he starts growing it here in, in Northern California. And then he basically, I'm like, look, the only thing I ask is every time you harvest, sell me all the weed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he would sell me these Tupperwares of weed, not even in a bag. And me and my friends would just smoke it all. It was no, it was just for us, you know. <laughs> and it was it was amazing. It was like I can't believe this. What a great life! I'm smoking my favorite weed, the Super Skunk, and I'm like, you know, it's just amazing. And he grew it better than anybody. You know, this guy really knows what he's doing. So, anyways. Yeah, so we became closer friends, and uh, then as we got a little closer, he said to me one day, he goes, hey, when this whole Grateful Dead thing ends, you know, I, I just want to tell you, like, I want to offer to you that I will give you genetics, and I will show you what everything I know about growing marijuana. And and I was like, great, because that's exactly what I'm going to do when this is over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was the plan all along. I was like, as soon as this is a, that was always the problem of tour to me because I was like, man, I, I could be growing marijuana somewhere. And I hadn't really. I'd only done it once in, in, before I left Virginia. And, um, but it's just I knew that's what I would have wanted to do. It was perfect. You're always at home. That's where I want to be. I love kind buds. You know, you're going to have plenty of those. It was a win-win. Hell yeah. So, he, uh, so Jerry did die a few years later. And I, I went to him and, you know, I said, all right, man. I'm coming up there. I'm going to move to Sonoma County and I'm going to get a place. And, and, uh, Oh no, I'm sorry. Reverse. I met a lady is, it ended up being my wife at, at one point, And, uh, she, uh, had convinced me, Hey, let's, uh, let's start settling down a little bit. You know, she was still in college. 
And then, uh, you know, she was going to Sonoma State University. And uh, so we were going to move up there. And I, you know, I got a hold of my buddy. One way or the other, we were getting a place up there. Now, this is before Jerry Garcia died. And uh, it was that it was that summer of 95, like June. And uh, we went up there. We found a place. And I, I, I called him up. And I said, hey, you know, I'm here. Come over. And, you know, he came over to the house. And we talked. And, and I was like, look, man, I'm settling in. I'm, uh, I'm going to made a little money recently. I'm going to go buy some lights and whatever you th- else you think I need. And, you know, I want to get this, I got this bedroom here and I'm going to start growing some pot in here. And he's like, all right, that's it. I'll bring it over to you. And so he brings me over my super skunk, you know, and he brings over the chem dog and that was it. And, uh, Oh, and he, oh, he brought over like some Hermes CD pop. That, now that was another thing back then. We never ever, but one of the, the things was that the first thing I heard was, if you ever find any seeds in your pot, throw them away. Eat them. Don't grow them. They'll always be shit, you know. But of course, later on, we found out that's not necessarily true. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, he comes he he comes through and uh, he does all that. And he it literally this all happened like the week before Jerry died. He died on August ninth, nineteen ninety five, and he brought all this up over to me. These plants and and he he filed through. He showed me what to do, and we had he had some pretty. So even today, cutting edge uh, methods of, of organic growing, you know, and uh, he showed me everything, and 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 the stuff came out. The first one came out just like his, you know. It was really impressive. I mean, he was a good teacher. He taught the number one thing he taught me. I'll never forget was don't ever think you know it all. Always pay attention to everyone else who's doing, you know, who's willing to tell you anything, no matter how, what their skill level is, no matter how long they're doing this. Always, always try to keep learning because one, the minute you think you've got it all figured out is the minute that when you ha- you'll have a problem and you won't have any idea what to do, <laughs> you know. So yeah. it was really good advice, and um, yeah, I got the books and and started it out. And uh, so he always told me he told me when he gives me the Kim dog, he says, "All right." And you know, he never he only he always had like a very small amount of this. He never had like like I said, he would sell me a quarter pound of. Head stash it would all be super skunk, you know, all the tops, the best buds, and then he would, and then he would like smoke a few joints and give me a nug of chem dog. That was the, always the thing. You never had like an ounce or two of it or whatever, you know. And I asked him, I was like, "What's the deal with that, man? It's the best one, clearly. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> killer, you know. All the strains he had, and he had some really nice ones. This was the best one. And he goes, "Dude, it's it's a bitch to grow. It's so hard to grow. It won't root." <laughs> you know, with this thick, heavy accent, it won't root. You know, it doesn't yield. You can't count on it. And uh, I was like, whatever, man. He goes, I was like, I, he, he, in, in other words, he was like, you don't really want this. When he gave it to me, he's like, you don't really want this. You can have it, but I know you're not going to be able to do much with it. And because I can't really do a whole bunch with it. And it's just, it was like that, you know. And I was like, whatever, dude. That's the best one. That's the one I want. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? And uh, he gives it to me and. The first one was a was a crop of super skunk, all 100% super skunk, and that little Hermie one that he gave me. And then uh, and then the next one, I, I was gonna you know take a bunch of cuttings off. I got this chem dog mother going pretty good, and he told me he goes, "Hey man, I'm telling you right now, you know it's better to stick with that super skunk. It roots in ten days, and you know it's got a quick veg, blah blah blah." I was like, "Man, I'm just gonna give it a shot. You know what's the worst that could happen?" So I took a bunch of cuttings of it, and it, sure enough, it rooted in like 14 days. And I was like, hmm, well, so far so good. So far what he told me is not true. And another thing he told me, I'll never forget, he says, the chem dog is for the night. He goes in his heavy accent, he's like, and never smoking a bubbler before 11 a.m. <laughs> That's the guy who like, he's just, like, this guy just smokes joint after joint after joint. And this is advice to me, right? I'm like, all right. So I probably pulled out a bubble right then and loaded it up and smoked it. It was probably before 11 a.m. I don't know. But anyway, so, and it came out really nice. Like I, I, I did. I grew it and it came out really nice. And I was like, all right, you know, the super skunk is definitely a bigger yielder. And that was very important to me. And, you know, so I, I'll just have a few of these. And that's the way it went. So years went by and, you know, that's the way it was. And like I said, you know, we, we weren't very connected back then, growers. It was it was very sparse and, and sporadic and, and unusual and rare when you would get a chance to, like, trade things with people. And, of course, the other thing he told me I should say was never, ever, ever give this to anybody. I'm giving this to you, and I shouldn't be. You know, I'm, I'm doing it, and as I'm giving this to you, I'm violating my friend's trust who told me not to give it to anybody. And I'm telling you, don't do that to me. 
don't ever get this new bike. And I was like, all right, yeah, no problem. You know, my word, my word is my honor. So yeah, I'll do that. And, uh, and the years went by, you know, kids came and, you know, life was pretty settled down and, you know, life was really different when Jerry died and, and there was a lot of adjustment for people like me and, um, just kept on growing the killer and, uh, trying to learn as I was going along. And then in 2005, fast forward, 2005, um, I looked at a High Times article that a friend recommended. He goes, you won't believe this, but this guy. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. I met a fella on tour who we became friends through the pot, you know, like talking about this bud, talking about that bud, showing each other buds would be fine, you know, like, you know, kind of sore type things. And, uh, you know, he became a good friend of mine. And he started talking to me about, coincidentally, you know, before Jerry died, he started talking to me about this pot chem dog, you know, uh, that he would grow, that he, that he would, uh, smoke when he was young, you know, the same kind of way I talked about the super skunk, but up in New Hampshire and Massachusetts area where he's from. And, uh, you know, it kind of went in one ear and went out the, at the, uh, out the other at the time, but I definitely remember that. Well, we became really good friends and even better friends, um, after Jerry died. And he's actually still really one of my closest friends to this day. And, uh, and now, um, yeah, let's see how it, it was, a uh, when I started, like when Jerry died, there was a big disconnect. Like it, we lost contact with each other. Like I said, we didn't have cell phones and stuff. And for a minute for, you know, a year, it was, it was like, it took a minute to get a hold of everybody and find everybody. Cause there was no events going on. It was the next thing didn't happen. So it just took a while. And I linked back up with this fellow who I'm talking about on, uh, he, um, I had the Kim dog now. And I smoked it with him, and he's like, dude, this is the fucking chem dog. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You you smoked this when you were young. You were always told me about your friend G. And I was like, because he, he knew G, I guess, you know. I mean, uh-huh. I, I know he did. They were, they were really close, actually, uh, you know, back when, I guess they, they met at a fish show or something like that, you know, back in the early 90s and or yeah. late 80s and had become good friends. And so it was kind of cool. It was a little connection, and, and uh you know, uh, he lived up in Tahoe. He moved up to Tahoe, and and I'd go up there and visit him, go snowboarding, and bring Kim Dog. And you know, he started a little thing, and he, you know, I gave him the Kim, I gave him the Kim Dog. Cause I'm figuring, hey, you know, the guy who cracked the seed, because he told me the story. He's like, yeah, my friend cracked the seed. He had the 13 or the 12, whatever the seeds, and you know, he started telling me the story. And I'm like, wow, that's what a coincidence that I actually ended up with this cutting, you know. So, um. So then I guess G at one point made these t-shirts, right? And, uh, he made a super skunk and a chem dog. And it, had these, it was like this light green, almost the color of the chem dog shirt. And it had that, this dog with the joint smoke, uh, this dog on the back smoking a joint, this little emblem he made for chem dog and it said chem dog since 91. And then he had a super skunk and it said super skunk since 1993. Cause that's when he got it, you know? Yeah. And they were kind of cool. And, uh, and so one day I go up there to go snowboarding and my friend gives me this, uh, Kim dog shirt and a, and a super skunk shirt. And I was like, wow, did you make these? And he's like, no, my friend G made these back East. And, and, uh, he sent me a few and I was like, he's like, you gotta have one. I was like, yeah, man, I love it. Still got it to this day, you know? And, uh, so that was probably like in 1998, 97 when that was going on. And then fast forward now to 2006, 2005, I see this high times article and it's an, it's a it, interview of G talking about the Kim dog, right? And they had actually gone into his garden or and taken pictures of his plants, and they were like in five gallon like Home Depot bucket type buckets, you know, and and uh, really beautiful plants, you know. And they were showing some pictures of the sister, what they said was the Ken dog, but clearly to me it was not the same plant that I had. And then uh, and then some Kim uh, something else. It might have been the Kim D, but it was definitely the sister, the sis they called it, the sister. I'm sure you've heard of it. It, it was it caught my eye. Yeah, I, I think like I went I to my buddy. My sister is um actually the number A. Right. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. And I was like, I got to have that. So I went to my buddy. I was like, and they talked. They were they were they were good friends. I was like, dude, I just saw this article with your buddy. And I was like, what do we got to do? I mean, what 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 can I do for us to go out there and get that cuz you know, I'm not sure he's even got the chem dog anymore. We could give him the chem dog back and then, you know, maybe he'll trade and actually, I'm sure we'd probably talked about going to get other strains before that time. But so I, uh, 
I was having a problem. I was, uh, I, I was the first time I'd ever seen powdery mildew, right? And I, was, I had it on my plants, and I, and I was like, what the hell is this? So I started, like, kind of searching. You know, now we have computers now and cell phones and shit, but not like we do, still not like we do today. And I, I got on the computer, and I started, like, kind of trying to find out what I could find out about it. Like someone said it's called mildew or powdery mildew or downy mildew, and I started, you know, trying to figure this stuff out. And um, it led me to this website called overgrow.com. And uh, it looked like a completely, it, to me, it looked like a fucking, you know, like a police trap or something. <laughs> <I> was like, <laughs> really? I started surfing around. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of cool, man. Like, I, I, all these people are anonymous and they're sharing knowledge here. They really are. I was learning stuff. I was staying up late at night and looking at it. And so naturally, I Googled, I, not Googled, but searched ChemDog. And this guy came up ChemDog, right? And, and, you know, looking through what he was saying, I could tell, holy shit, this is this guy, G, this is my buddy's friend right here. This is the guy that I was looking at his pictures, last, you know, last month or whenever it was, you know, uh, of this high times article. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to this guy. So I got that t-shirt that he made out and I took a little picture of the emblem. Cause you had to have like a, like a avatar, just like you got to have with all the things we use today. And I called myself Skunk VA, you know, Super Skunk Virginia made sense, right? Yeah. So I, I sent and and you know the overgrow is a serious thing. Like that, you know, now when you go on those forums, you know, there's a lot of assholes and know it alls, and but people are really open and willing to share back. At, on overgrow, they were a little bit more cautious. When they would converse with you. They wanted to see pictures and stuff. You know, they didn't want to just start talking with anybody about growing and all, giving you all their little trade secrets or even asking you questions. So if you put on a few pictures, I saw if you put a few pictures up, you know, you could get a better conversation going when people saw you were serious. You're not joking around here. You know, you got, you got some, you're growing some pot, you know? So I put some pictures up of chem dog and, uh, and then I put that little avatar on there and then, and immediately he, he like sends me like one of them little, you know, like private messages. Is like, Hey, where'd you get that shirt? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was like, I just gave the first letter of the of our mutual friend, and he was like, "Oh, oh, do you live up in Tahoe?" And I said, "No, but you know, we've known each other for you know ten years now. We're really close, and this, that, and the other." And he tells me, he goes, "I don't, I don't have the chem dog anymore." And I was like, "I know you don't. I saw that, you know." And and I was like, "But today's your lucky day because, you know, Phil Lesh is Phil Lesh is the bass player for the Grateful Dead, and he was getting he was playing. And this was like in December." of 2005 and he was playing in february 2006 in new york like nine nights and it kind of just planned just like almost just materialized i was like listen i will come out there check out phil and i'll bring you your chem dog back and i if you could just give me like trade the sis for me the sister and he was like absolutely you know and of course you know we didn't it wasn't right away we chit chatted for you know like a week or two a little bit and got to sort of make sure that we knew who we were talking to and um, I'm sure he called my friend and made sure that, you know, it, it all lined up and it did. And so I took a couple of chem dog cuttings in New York, put them on the plane with me and flew them out to New York and got a place, the, the Soho Suites down in Soho. And, and the night I got there, the biggest snowstorm they've had since like 1953 or 43 or something. It was amazing. And, uh, but it did delay our meeting and, and we eventually met up and he brought me over. He didn't give me the sister and I'm not really sure. Never really got to never have still this day. Never talked to him about that, but, um, but he did bring me the chem D, you know, and then, and then to my surprise and to my joy, he actually brought the super skunk, which we had lost out here. We had lost that like in 1997. My buddy was getting a house inspection by the landlord, and he had the one mother. Now, my friend from Staten Island, the New York, the guy I was talking about earlier at the Ford Field, and he um, he basically uh, had this plant in a box, and it just didn't make it through the inspection, you know. Yeah. So we hadn't had it in a while, and so he gives that back to me, and I was really happy, you know, and uh, it was real cool. So I take that back, and then uh, at this point, me and my friend in Tahoe, his our mutual friend, me and G's mutual friend, we had our own place, and we were, you know, we were we grew the Kim D. Now we had the Kim D on the West Coast. You know, to me, it wasn't it wasn't like 
it's not really my i don't love the kim d as much as i think the public loves i'm more of a kim dog guy but uh but it, but nonetheless the super skunk was back and it was the super skunk it was the same exact cutting definitely at age because the super skunk got that seed had gotten cracked in 1988, so it's actually been around longer than the chem dog. You know, if it's still out there, I don't have it. I don't know anybody who's got that cutting anymore, per se. But I definitely, you know, this is where, where the side story goes off because the guy who cracked that seed, that super skunk seed in Virginia back in 1988, he's one of my closest friends now. You know, and he was oh, wow. a friend. Uh, uh, so I know it's a really, it's a really special thing to me because. Um, that's actually a Facebook story, you know, like a Facebook modern day kind of computer story. That I link back up to him and I'm really grateful to have that man back in my life because he, he was, he's older than me. You know, he, I, he's like an, uh, an elder to me and I look up to him and, and, uh, he's, it's just really special, but it's like, I can't believe the circles you think you comp- you know, all the circles are, are all now complete. And then all of a sudden, boom, one day you got this whole other part of your past is back in your future back in your present and special, you know, but, yeah. um, but what the reason I was jumping is cause he actually has not the super skunk, but we, we now have back the parent, uh, the super skunk was at, I didn't know this until recently, but the super skunk actually wasn't just a crack from Neville seeds from the super sativa seed bank. It was actually a cross that he made with super skunk and uh, that he got, he actually crossed, took two uh, super skunk seeds and crossed them together. Ah, oh, so it was an F two. Did something else? It might have been. I I, ha, I don't know the exact detail. I, I don't want to get quoted on that quite yet because it, it was okay. something like that. But he has one of the parents to that super skunk, which to me is that's awesome. You know, we'll see what we can do with that too. Yeah. You know. But, Sorry, I was going to say maybe we'll get back into that. Sorry, I just wanted to go back to the chem dog for a second. So when you said that um you saw immediately that um chem uh, sorry Mass G didn't have the chem dog, that was uh what now is referred to as the Joe Brand cutting. Am I right? Uh, this was this was this was before. Yeah, uh, you'd have to ask G about this, but I I'm under the impression that this would have been before they went back up. I'm not sure, hundred percent sure about that, but it might it might have been you know linked back up after their original meeting back in Deer Creek in '91. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it wasn't it, it to me. It looked like it might have been Kim D. I'm not really sure what it was, but I can't re- really remember. I'm sure the High Times article is still around, but I don't remember what it was. And it was just I just noticed that either there was a picture that wasn't actually Kim Dog. Or also, it could have been, I, it was just conspicuously missing from all these photos. You know what I mean? I think it yeah. might have even been that. Okay. It might, so, my memory's a little foggy. But I yeah, no problem. I probably actually still have it. The pictures are beautiful. Like, the sister, just unbelievable. It was really nice, you know. I was going to say, so if we were to compare, say, the Chem Sister and the Chem D and the Chem 4 and the 91... Um, you kind of mentioned earlier that the 91 was your favorite. Why do you think it is then, for example, that um, people like JJ and Rez choose to work with the D um, kind of as their, you know, to work those lines out over, say, the 91? My, my guess from what I can see is that I think that, I mean, I'm going on a limb here saying that maybe they didn't have the, the 91, you know? Yeah. I mean, I have to say that's probably what it was, you know, or they had that fake Joe Brand 91, which, you know, I even, I was even around when that happened. So, yeah. you know, I, I, that's my guess. I don't know. I mean, I also, it, maybe it, I'm so biased that I have to come up with something like that because I can't understand why. I, I mean, I have the Kim D. I think it's, it's got its place in life, but it's, it's so far different than the Kim dog. It really is. You know, it's not. Uh, to me, it's not even close to the same, not, not, not just the level of quality, but the same type, like in the same ballpark, like comparable even, you know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. way different. Like that, that fuel smell is really different on the chem dog 91 compared to the chem D to me. It's just, you could po- totally be in love with one and not even care about the other. And I guess what I'm saying is maybe the, it, it's just the opposite for other people. Maybe they just see it different. I understand. I met P bud, later in life here too lately like through instagram and i i think he mentioned that to me that he likes the chem dog d better the chem d better than the chem dog too so i think it's just i'm so heavily biased about chem dog that i love it so much i think that maybe it's hard for me to understand why that would happen 
Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, I guess it kind of goes without saying because you kind of alluded that you weren't fully aware. But I guess just to kind of rule the story straight, um, when G did go down from all that res business, were you aware that you were the only one with the 91 cutting or it wasn't until you saw that high time story and then it kind of dawned on you that you were the only one who had it? I had... I hadn't, um, I don't think I was the only one with it because those, like, back to those Staten Island crew, I, I got to hang out with them at one point in Tahoe when they came to visit. Interesting crowd. And they, they, uh, I think they had it. I'm pretty sure they had some chem dog. And I have no idea what any of those guys were up to these days, but they, they, they definitely had it. So I never really felt like I was the only one that had the chem dog during those years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I didn't really know what happened to G. Like, it wasn't like my buddy, even though he was close with him, it wasn't like he was sitting around, give me the blow by blow, what was going on with that guy. Cause that was our only encounter. He came to my hotel. We hung out. We traded some stories. We going, if I had to do it over again, we would have had a lot more to talk about. I just didn't know how much, how much in common we had with people and things and stuff in life. But, um, but that's all, that's all we did. We did the trade and I, I came back and brought the Kim D and the super skunk back and, and I gave him two really beautiful cuts of the chem dog, you know. And he yes. was just as happy as I was, believe me. Yeah. And, um, so that was the only reason I did that thing on Overgrow, though. That was the only reason is to try to get that trade, just to do what, what you know, it seemed like an opportunity for me to get some other genetics out to the West Coast in my life. And I, uh, I you know, that was the whole reason I did it. To me, like I said, I'm kind of an introverted person when it comes to this stuff. I'm trying to break out of my shell and step into the light, so to say, and, and to start like an internet account and like give myself a name and put pictures of my garden on the internet. That was like insane to me. That was to my perspective. That was the most insane thing I could do, but it worked, you know, and, uh, I never really went back over to overgrow and I was, um, I wasn't blown away by the Kim D and I still didn't have the sisters. So maybe I was kind of, had a little bad taste in my mouth a little bit. It was no big deal. I, I, I think it was pretty cool how it all happened and, and it happened. And, and, you know, we ended up having the Kim D on the West coast. We didn't have that before. And that was cool, you know, and then yeah. it got spread all over the West coast, you know? So, so that, that's what happened. And then, um, and then overgrow of course got shut down. I don't know the details of that story, but I know overgrow got shut down. And I think the, government shut them down and they took their servers and all this other stuff and so just compounded my belief that hey you need to keep your business to yourself and certainly don't go to the internet with it <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah so uh 2012 i uh i had another problem all of a sudden in my garden that i couldn't solve and um you know i had these plants that looked like they were being poisoned with salt water you know and i'm flushing them and i'm looking through the through the root balls with a microscope and you know, I, now I'm going back to the internet. Now it's back six years later. I'm back on the internet and, and I, I Google like, you know, cannabis forum and, uh, you know, uh, w- what's the one that they have several of them popped up, but I went with the, uh, I, I went see on the, you know, what's it? Yeah, that one. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to think of. And I give myself a name and I start up the whole thing and I'm, I'm going through there and I'm looking through. I'm looking through bugs and, you know, I'm, I'm researching tobacco mosaic virus. I'm getting way, way deep in this. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, same thing. I put some pictures on there and, and, uh, and I put basically the same pictures probably because I have a hard drive of my pictures and I don't have a lot of pictures, but I got some of my favorite pictures and I'm sure I put my favorite ones on there. Well, I know I did. And, uh, <laughs> immediately I like a hundred people messaged me and they're like, where did you get those pictures? Like kind of stern with me, you know? And I was like, I took them. They're my pictures. I got them from my hard drive. What, what's the deal? You know, how are you doing? And, uh, they're <laughs> like, those are skunk. Those are skunk VA's pictures. Where did you get those? But you're, you're like an imposter. I was like, <laughs> I'm an imposter. And they all clicked back in my head. I'd completely forgot about this. I mean, really like I had not really thought about this overgrowth thing in years at this point. And it, it went right into my head. And I started talking to this one guy who was clearly paying attention to the chem dog by ta- you know, telling me what he knew about the story and stuff. And he was repeating. And he goes, are you skunk VA? And I was like, I mean, I guess so. Because, I mean, that was, I, that's, you know, I was on overgrow with skunk VA. And it all popped back in my head. And I was like, holy shit. Because it freaked me out when all these people started texting. I was like, 
or uh, you know, messaging me on this thing, you know, and, and uh, it was kind of it was really funny, it was really surreal, and uh, so anyways, um, ended up that I had broad mites and and you know had to go through that and learn that and you know take the brunt on that so I could tell everybody else what I learned about it and how to get rid of that shit. So, uh, anyways, that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. That's where I met G. Uh, and, you know, now we're all kind of getting linked up, and, it, and it's really cool. It's a really special thing to be part of, you know. It's, and uh, for me, this year was the 21st year I've had it, the chem dog cutting. And, uh, you know, she's been in my care every single day, every single one of those days. And I ended up giving, I think I counted on my hand, I ended up giving it over these years. I ended up giving it to uh, five people. Uh, several of those people, a uh, couple of those people more than once couple of those people a bunch of times <laughs> and, and then a couple of those people I gave it to it once and the only reason I ever gave it to anybody because I took that very seriously and I and I I uh I you know I I had friends question our friendship because I wouldn't give it to them at times but I it wasn't anything because I told my friend I never would you know and then in the end that all it you know that that seemed kind of silly now so I mean but that's that's really how, how it was. I mean, I really felt that way, you know, and I told my friend I wouldn't and I wouldn't, you know, you know, through, through those years, you know, like from, from that 2006 up until like 2012 time and, and even a little bit longer, actually, I would say even a, it's still a couple of years ago, you know, chem dog was a, it was a muddy thing because no one had the chem dog and everyone had the chem dog. I mean, it was everywhere. It was in all the clubs. You could get cuttings of it, but none of it was chem dog, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I spent, I spent I spent summer two thousand eight going from garden to garden. You know, people would call me up, hey man, you know, friends would call me up and say, Hey man, I, I, I I'm running the chem dog out here on my property in Mendo. I need you to come and it's not really looking like it to me and I need you to come up and check it out and go up there and see, you know, a giant forest of giant outdoor hundred and fifty outdoor plants, you know. And then and having to tell them, say, No, I'm sorry. I mean, I, this isn't the sour diesel, but it looks a lot like the sour diesel. <laughs> but it's definitely not the chem dog, you know. And uh, turns out that that was that that Joe B thing that happened, you know. Oh, uh, okay. That whole mix up. I, I I I have the whole details on how that happened because, you know, my my good friend was there, and uh, and there was a big mix up there. And uh, and but I I think I'd rather leave that out of it because I haven't really talked to him and see how much he wants people to know about, you know, how that happened and stuff like that and. Yeah. Whatever. So I'll just leave that out of it. But uh, but that's what that's what as I understand and, and according to him and, and he knows he knows who he gave it to and what the mix up was and and uh, and he knows how that happened and I guess that was that Joe B cut of Chem Dog that was out here and probably elsewhere too in that two thousand seven two thousand six or seven or eight era right there and yeah. um. Uh, so, uh, but, but what I'm saying is, it's like, so you might, you know, as someone who loves chem dog and you're growing it and, you know, trying to get by in life and stuff, you know, you're like, Hey, I've got some chem dog. Would you be interested in looking at that? You know, whoever it was, would it eventually got to the point where people didn't want to look at it because they'd already seen it and they didn't like it, but they never saw it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It got so bad sometimes where I would show it to people, you know, finally say, no, this is chem dog. And in their mind, they'd already made up their mind about what they thought Kim Dog was and their, and their opinion about it, and they would just brush it away. And I'm like, "This is killer pot. Like, what are you? What's wrong with you? You know what I mean?" <laughs> so for like four years, I thought I was the only one who liked Kim Dog. You know what I mean? Me and my couple friends, you know. And then yeah. recently, because of the internet or or because breeding is becoming, you know, a more prevalent thing in the United States, maybe the Kim Dog is making its comeback now, and and people are more willing to, to stop and pay attention to the to the deal with the chem dog and you know how how what it's it's such the backbone of contemporary can, cannabis and you know i think in the world now i mean i live here in california and, and you know it definitely is i mean every strain that you see has got something to do with chem dog at some point you know and uh and then you know in 2003 um i i had a, a short-lived partnership with a person and here in uh, Sonoma County, and uh, and uh, this person had sour diesel, and this was the first time I'd seen sour diesel. And I was like, "Good Lord, this stuff smells familiar." You know, I mean, it has all of my favorites in it. Come to find out, most likely, you know, as the story goes, some point back then, one of those guys in Staten Island somehow—I don't know what happened. I mean, I've heard so many different versions, and like I said, I wasn't there. 
but somehow, some way, the super skunk that they got from my friend of Virginia and that chem dog got tangled up in a in a hermy fest, and uh, and I think that's how the sour diesel came about. So I thought that was kind of cool. I I really I think that because I mean clearly that's it's not the I mean that's got to be the most you know famed strain of weed on you know on the planet you know. Yeah, so I was actually going to ask you, um, do you ever feel like you kind of don't get any credit where you should for that? Because I was going to say, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, the Sour D is the 91, just getting, throwing a bit of pollen on the Super Skunk. Do you feel like you should get some credit for that or do you think you're kind of too far removed? Because when I think about it, both of those strains are very much attributable to yourself in a lot of ways. They they definitely are, but I would give I would I I know this sounds like some hippie shit, but I would give the Grateful Dead credit because, like I said, I just I would I just introduced some a couple of my favorite growers to each other. That's literally all I did. You know what I mean? They did all the hard work. They flew out, met each other. You know, they did all that stuff. So I don't I'm not I don't really want credit, but and I'm not you know I understand that there's another story out there where they went to Amsterdam and got some super skunk. So maybe maybe they had another super skunk. Who knows, you know? But I definitely know that my my friend from New York, he he definitely left a super skunk behind with them and and like I said, I, I got that cut that they think that the sour diesel when I got that one, the super skunk from uh, and and actually he he knew he knew somehow he knew that that was the same cut. And he somehow he was kind of the one that even told me, you know what I mean? That yeah. the super skunk that he was giving me was the same one that he that he got back then, which was the same as the mass skunk. He says to you, "I'm calling it the super skunk," but they call it the mass skunk here. You know what I'm saying? And then yeah. coming home, I grew it, and sure as shit, it was the super skunk, no doubt about it. All the little features were there. Like I said, that pregnant belly, the smell is unforgettable. You know, it's it's loud like the sour diesel. It's 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 unforgettable. I mean, it smells just like. A, a skunk on the road from about 150 yards you know it's <laughs> it's 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 un, un, just unmistakable so, so I, I don't know exactly what happened and I, and I don't really want any kind of credit for anything like that but, I, but like i said i would give jerry garcia and the grateful dead credit because man what a, what are what, what an amazing connection that is you know that those guys made and to tr- make those trade because if they didn't do that and if he didn't bring the chem dog back out here my friend from new york he gave up on the Kim dog. And then I really was the only one in my world who had it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I ended up giving it to other people because I wanted to make sure I wasn't, if something happened to me, you know, or my place, I didn't want anything that, and I didn't want the, I understood the gravity of the situation that this could go away forever. So I always made sure that someone else had it, you know, and then, you know, it ended up being, over the years, I gave it to, I think five people total. And only really one of them ever really kept it. And he's my, my good friend who I knew from Tahoe, like I was talking about earlier, you know. So, yeah, so I was going to say, so when we see breeders these days, um, you know, notably we've got uh, Bodie and also uh, Swerve of the Calicon claiming to be breeding with the skunk VA cutting. That, I mean, I guess you've kind of already alluded to the answer that, that they're obviously not getting it directly from you. Do you think that when people see a breeder claiming to be breeding with the skunk VA cutting, they should kind of view that with an eye of caution, or do you think it's probably legit? It's just come through someone through someone. Uh, well, I'll say this. I'll say that you know the way I look at it is like this because you know you could go and you could you could get into this tit for tat with this, and and it, you know it does matter. You know it, the truth matters. It really does. I I truly believe that. I believe that. What you say and the truth, it, it, you know, it should line up, you know. And if your story is, is that you did some stupid little shady deal in the back room to get the cuts that you have or whatever it is, you know, you know, that's your story. You know, stick, you got to you gotta go with it. It's going to come out at some point, you know. And, and the way I look at it is this, is that as we go forward, I do think it matters because, you know, at some point we're all going to be, completely i believe this this is my opinion i believe that all of us here in the united states we're going to be completely you know out in the open and you're going to have your story you know how did this happen to you you know why did you choose to do this why did you choose to risk your freedom to do this and then and then what are the details it is interesting i mean this is really cool stuff i mean it's like prohibition is ending and it's taken a while for certain but i gotta say back when you know i turned on the lights for the first time i didn't I never, ever thought we would get this far. So this thing's going quicker than any of us thought. 
And uh, you know, if your story's a lie, then you're gonna have to pay, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with that. It's not anything for me to have a big opinion about. You're gonna have to deal with that if that's what's going on in your life. You know what I mean? Not yeah. you, of course, but whoever it is. You know, I, I kept it above the board, you know, and, and like I did my part. You know, the thing that people don't realize, I think, in this, uh, you know, world of marijuana growing consultants that we live in, and that's a joke, is that, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, this plant's not doing this for us. You know, like, we're not, we're not the stars of the show here. You know what I mean? We're, yeah. the, we're tools in a toolbox for the plant. The plant doesn't have eyes. The plant doesn't have feet for certain. You know, the plant, it needs protection. And the reason cannabis, in my opinion, has evolved so quickly in the last 20 years, 30 years, is because, you know, it's speaking to people and we're listening and we're doing what we're being told. You know, we're following the, the we're, we're following what we needs to happen to make A and B happen, you know, make the thing happen. And the plant thanks us for it and it gives back to us. And that's what I believe. I think that we work for the plant. You know, that's that's what I think. I think that the Kim dog needed somebody. A Kim dog's a powerful plant. You know, my friend from New York, he used to tell me, I don't know, man. He used, he used to say to me, I think it's tied into the stars because sometimes he would have really good luck. And he would just like this guy was skilled. He made he grew the best. And sometimes it didn't work out with him. The Kim dog, just like for me, it doesn't work. I mean, sometimes I'm like, what the hell happened here? You know, it's not going like it did the last time. What's going on? It's finicky yeah. a little bit, you know. And he used to tell him, he used to be convinced, and this is a very, like, you know, mechanically minded, like, nuts and bolts kind of guy. And he was telling me, I think it's lined up with the stars. And I would look at him like, what are you talking about? He goes, I don't know. It, it's just, it's, you never know. I just going to, I think it has a lot to do with the star alignments and, and the moons and the cycles of the the galaxy and the solar system. And it's affecting the chem dog. And I'd be like, <laughs> dude, you sound like, you sound like you're on drugs, man. What is the matter with you? But um, but that's kind of how it is, though. You know what I mean? It's kind of it's a very very powerful plant, and it's it found its safe havens. It did. You know, I'll I'll tell I'll share a little story with you. You know, I'll, I'll uh, um, you know, like the chem dog, right? So it's 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 being grown in house A. I'm going to keep this like non personal. This part It's growing in house A, right? Yeah. And then you know, and then and then the guy who's in house A, he has like you know he's hasn't seen a lot of his friends for years, or maybe he hasn't seen some key friends in some years, you know, like life gets busy. And then they randomly bump into each other, right? At like a, uh, at one of those cannabis cups, the Emerald Cup, you know, yeah. in, here, here in Sonoma County, right? And they reconnect, change phone numbers. You know, phone numbers are changing, and sometimes you lose connect with people, especially if they're not on social media and stuff. And then, uh, hey, man, I don't have the chem dog, person B says to person A. Can you give it back to me? Of course I can. You know what I mean? Of course. I'm, I'm glad you asked. Come on over as soon as you can. I have cuttings for you. So person B comes to person A's house. He gets the plant from him. Super grateful. Thank you. And then person A gets arrested a week later, and they kill all of his chem dog plants. That's a true story. You know what I mean? That's that's magic to me, you know? That plant had some sort of like, in my opinion, this is some hippie shit, but in my opinion, that plant had some forethought of what was getting ready to happen. And somehow, some way, somehow, cosmically, it found itself out of a bad situation. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. that's a true story. You know, that, that yeah. was a recent story. That happened not that long ago. And I mean, you know, so what I'm trying to say is I think that, you know, we should be more humble when we talk about our contributions to this. And just remember that we're, we're just part of the puzzle. We're just part of the toolbox that this plant's using to evolve. Because, you know, cannabis... Uh, cannabis use is, you know, it's it's through the roof. I mean, everybody uses cannabis now. I think they got President Obama's kid on film the other day smoking a joint. I mean, it's <laughs> it's a big cannabis to me is in, in the relationship it has to humans. It's it's symbiotic. It's it's uh, you know, we live in a stressful world. We're polluting ourselves. We we've got we're bombarded with negative news and and bad media and just you know it's just a weird world we live in it's not, i love it here i think planet earth is an amazing place but it's, we got our challenges here and it's stressful yeah of you course know, it's stressful just to put food on the table and i think that cannabis really truly helps people get through that make it okay and, and beyond now we're now we're doing cancer research with it and you know they're doing research in alzheimer's all the things and i think that it's a big part of our evolution and in the and as we look back in history many years from now say 30 40 50 years we're gonna i think society's gonna recognize that that 
this plant, you know, evolved quickly at, at the right time for us so that it become a useful tool for us in the world that we're creating for ourselves, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, and of course. The people who the people who are doing the things, say me and G, you know, meeting the guy in the parking lot, that's an, that's some grateful dead shit right there. That's what I'm talking about. Meeting a guy in a parking lot and then, you know, twenty five years later we're sitting here talking about Kim Dog. You know what I mean? It's amazing, you know, but I think the plant is the the motivator and all that. And it you know, it's like any symbiotic relationship in nature or in the universe is, you know, one organism needs the other. So it does what it needs to help that organism. That organism benefits from that aid. So it returns the favor back to the, you know, in this sense, the caretaker, the other organism. And it just keeps going round and round. And then in that process, and it's an evolution of, of two organisms becoming better beings because of that relationship. And I think that's what our, you know, but to answer your question, you know, I, I don't I I don't know those guys. I've never met those people before. Um, you know, I don't I don't know what their motive is, I don't know what they're doing, but I do know that at the end of the day when we're all sitting around the table and this war is finally over, we're all gonna have stories and some of them are gonna be a lot more interesting than others. That's all I can tell you about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the ninety one <laughs> cutting, over the uh twenty one years you've had it. Do you think kind of on that same theme of evolution we were just talking about, do you think it's phenotypically kind of changed at all? Like I guess kind of when you took it back to G, did, was it just like he just instantly recognized it or do you think it had, it had ch- kind of changed just a little bit over the years you'd had it and when you took it back, like he knew it was the 91 but it was just a little different when he had it or do you think it was the same? I think that – I think that I would agree that there's definitely been some genetic drift over the years a little bit. There are definitely some traits that have waned. Uh, the drug traits, uh, as 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 Duke would call them, I like that. I like that phrase. I stick with it. But the drug traits have not changed. They, they're they're as strong as they ever were. The 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 flavor trait has definitely taken back a step over the time. It has now. Sometimes um, I've noticed, I, I mean, because like I said, there was other cuttings out there, and they, and they are one by one every now and again. I don't know how many there were. Clearly, there wasn't very many, but every now and again, you'll see something, you're like, that's the chem dog. And then you'll smoke it, and you go, that does not taste like the chem dog, you know, like the one I got, you know, the one I smoked. So I don't know how that works. I don't really know how that works. I'm actually, it's something I'm really interested in right now is, is, uh, is is what we can do about that to slow that process down or even hopefully repair that process and you know i'm working on that right now but i did some digging around on your instagram and it was approximately 63 weeks ago someone asked you were you going to release the chem dog to the public in seed form and your reply was i'm working on it you want to tell us a little more about that (laughs) Well, yeah, sure. I, uh, you know, I got a company. It's called Lucky Dog Seed Company, and uh, you know, I'm I'm in the process of uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm developing a male that I feel represents the Kim dog, and uh, that I can breed with and make make hybrids with, and and then every now and again um, release some uh, some back crosses with itself, you know. And uh, I'm I'm pretty. I've gotten. I have had a lot of luck with it, and I've gotten. I think. You know, a project like that could, if you really do it, I think most breeders would tell you that could take 10 years, you know, to get that exactly right and lots of testing. And the thing about testing that, I'll, that I've learned, because this is new to me, this I haven't really done a lot of breeding before, but it's it's going really well and I, I, I really enjoy it. And I had a little, um, like, kindness come back to me in seed form uh, from some things that I did in the past. I gave it, I gave the cut to someone many years ago. On just a whim, it was a, uh, it was. So I, when I said only one person ever did anything with it, I got to back up. That would be two people because he definitely, he 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 was breeding and he was talking to me about breeding and he was like blowing on mine. It's like 2004, I think, and I gave him a cut of the chem dog. And then uh, let's see, three years ago, uh, two years ago, we ran back into each other. We lost contact, and he actually gave me some seeds that he worked with uh, that cut of chem dog I gave him. And he had some good success with it. He gave me some stuff back that I could get going with, and it actually it actually was uh, was really helpful. It got me gave me a good head start on what I was trying to do, and uh, so it was kind of cool to me. It was really it was kind of cool because I, 
never expected that. Like it was just, I knew he was going to do something good with it. I gave it to him. And then, you know, a bunch of handful, 10, 10 years later, he gives them back to, some seeds back to me. And it's really, it's turning out to be something. So, um, yeah, I don't want to put anything out there that I don't 100 for fully percent, you know, stand behind. And, and, uh, but I feel like, I feel like by the beginning of this next year, we're going to have something going here. And we, we, also, we don't want to just have two or three things. I want to have a nice meal that I can make a bunch of hybrids with, with some of my favorite strains and, and then, you know, give that to the public. And yeah, so that's where that's at. Yeah, awesome. That was actually kind of leading into the next question. I was going to say it's kind of a two-parter. So I noticed you had uh, those seeds, which were, uh, I think you said you used a silverback OG male. Um, if we think about Res Dog's work and JJ's work, they use the Hindu Kush and the Afghani respectively. What do you think is the ideal male to complement the Chem 1? Because the thing which stood out to me is that I know that JJ and Res use the Chem D, but there was still kind of that commonality within that Afghan land race they decided to use for the male. Do you kind of agree with that or do you think, no, nah, maybe the more chemi OGs is a better suited male for this? Well, I, I think that's the same thing because I look at that. Um, I would agree with that. And, and I'm, I feel like I'm doing the same thing in the sense that, the, in my opinion, the OG Kush is, is a... Um, is an Afghanica type of strain, just like the Kim dog is. It's a clearly, I think it's a high elevation, um, cooler nights, a lot more used to it, it can withstand like a lot more UV light than a lot of the lower land strains would be. Um, something that grew at a high elevation near the very bright sun with a lot less protection, making its own protection. I think that's where those Afghanica strands, that's where they get that glossy dark green leaf. I think it's a, uh, I think it's protection on the, uh, the their their natural environment that they came from, where they were exposed to extremely, I mean, not hot days, definitely not hot days, and certainly some cool nights, but also some very intense sunlight. You know, yeah. Um, so I would say that I agree with that, and but I think that OG Kush falls into that category. I feel like it's clearly an Afghanica, uh, you know, Kush strain, and. Uh, so I think that that's a good place to start, and that is kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working. Um, I took a back cross uh, OG cross OG Kush back cross that I've been working on, and now that's what I'm working on developing this mail with. You know, so, awesome. And like I said, uh, I just released a, well, just named a strain. Um, it's called Chem Crush with a K, and it, it's it's a nice um, marriage of OG Kush and Chem uh, with a heavy heavy Chem flavor and smell to it you know and very chunky it's beautiful pot and it's got that gloss on the on the families that i was looking for and and everything and and, and to back up a little bit it's actually the silverback og you're, you're talking about the silver chem that's from my ic collective here in the Oak, oakland in the bay area that's a plant that that's a strain they developed that's actually a feminized seed uh that was a chem dog feminized cross with a silverback og which I've never seen. I've never seen the silverback OG. Uh, okay. But uh, the, that's what that's what the silver. The silver chem is. It's a. It's a. It's just a one single plant uh, from some feminized seeds my friend made. At Icy Collective. Yeah. Okay. And so, if you did uh, get this mail, what would be some of the other clone onlys you'd want to mate it with? Like, what are some of your favorite clone onlys we kind of haven't talked about? Hmm. Well, that's a good question right there. Um, well, it's not very, it's not very, I don't have a lot of favorites, you know, like I really only smoke chem dog. I, I smoke the, my new one is my favorite one. The chem crush is turned. That's what I've been smoking all summer. It's my favorite one. Um, but after that it's chem dog. And then, you know, I, I'm going to experiment with crossing with some of these feminized seeds, like, uh, taking some, like for this instance, the silver chem. And then there's another one called the Chem Scout. I'm definitely going to try that, um, but I'm going to be really reserved and cautious with that, you know, because I want I'm going to be worried about Hermes. Although I don't see any Hermes on those plants, um, I'm learning as I'm going here, and I understand that the community is is concerned about uh, you know feminized seeds in that regard, you know. So, but that, and then, um, um, you know. The, the ultimate goal really is to get the back cross, the chem dog back cross in the seed form. That's really what I'm shooting for. So I can release that to the public and say this for sure, 100% in my 
is Kim Dog, you know, whatever ends up being a back cross, blah, blah, blah. And this came from a Kim Dog 91 cut for sure. You can guarantee it. There's no question mark about it. There's no weird story behind it where you're going to find out later on. They don't have that. That's exactly what it is. I think that's what the public is would like to have. And I, and I think certainly by the time I get this thing where I want it to be, that's going to be the demand, I think. So that's, you know, to, to, to name off a bunch of strains, I have a bunch, but I don't really know where I'm going to go with that. So I don't, I can't really tell you yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, no problem. And so, the, um, kind of the inspiration to start all of this, did that kind of get lit up when you kind of noticed that, um, some of the older people from the overgrown forums, for example, were getting more active in the scene? Like, for example, we've seen Oregon Kid and Mr. Soul, they're both getting things slash have gotten things back underway. Was that kind of a bit of yeah. a catalyst for you to think like, now's the time for me to get my head in the seed game? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, uh. It's 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 interesting to me. Like the the possibilities are endless, and I I, I see that it kind of clicked with me, and, and uh, you know I just feel like that it, it's it's just the next step for me. It's something that I can contribute back, and uh, and that's what I want to do. You know, and and I, I I feel like I've you know I can I've got the growing of cannabis down, and I can it's 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 like a machine, you know, <laughs> it's like, there's not much more I can do to tweak it. I mean, of course there's always going to be some new things that come along, new technologies, I would guess, and things like that. But it's, there's really not much room for me to grow in that area. I'm getting what I want from that. And, uh, and I just want to take it to the next step and see what I can do. You know, I've got the tools and like I said, you know, I, I, after, you know, a bunch of years, after two decades of doing this, I, I can see when, you know, this is leading me in a direction, you know, yeah. And, uh, and I've gotten, I've, I've gotten the signs that that's where this is going and I'm just kind of going with the flow. I feel like, I feel like genetics when I was a kid in the early eighties, I feel like the genetics, the old school genetics, I feel like they were in some ways a lot better than what we have these days. And I don't know if that's perception necessarily, but that definitely is my perception. And, uh, I don't know if that's all it is, but I, I would like to get things more isolated again and that's that's what i want my contribution to do uh, to be is to get things more isolated so that you know at, you know when people in you know whatever people in the next state that legalizes wants to, to grow their, their six plants or whatever their big brother allows them to grow i want them to be able to like not have to spend 20 years or 10 years or five years trying to find what they're looking for you know, they should be able to get what they want. You know, they should be, they, they know what they like. They like OG Kush. They, they want to get that. They like that flavor. They know what they're looking for, you know? And so I want to get that. I want to, I would like to try to get that to the point where we're isolating things back. You know, I want to get those skunks back, those skunk smells back. They're, I think they're missing. I don't think that we're really, there's big notes when I feel like someone shows me what they are talking about skunk. And I'm using skunk as an example because I think that we all, when we were young, I think that was all, you know, our favorite we do we kind buds that we fell in love with you know and uh but i don't smell that specifically anymore when i smell when i'm out in the world checking plants out beautiful pot not saying it's not great strain super high thc and those things are great but i also think that we need to isolate those flavors and those smells back out so we don't lose them forever and they're still in there they're in there and if and if if you work hard enough i think and if you go through enough of it i think you can isolate it. and a lot of luck i've learned I think that you can isolate those traits back and we can, we can reintroduce them back to the population. And, and if people want to get them muddy back up again, that's their, that's their business. They can do that. But, you know, I think that somewhere it needs to be, you know, in other words, like taking those memories I have of that mouth watering cannabis that I haven't seen in a while, not to say, like I said, that we don't have a lot of great things these days. Cause man, people are, are making some amazing things I've seen, but getting those things and isolating them back to where, you know, we can, kind of reset the button and start over and start working them again and see what we can do when we're not, you know, hiding in our basements, you know, from, from the big brother, you know what I mean? And, 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 uh, and each other even, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's, that's kind of my vision. That's kind of my goal. That's what I want to do. And that's, I have, I'm hoping that's what I can, my next step can be in this kind in this, in this, in this process, you know? 
Yeah, well, I mean, as someone from Australia who's uh, in that position of where Big Brother is, kind of looking at the possibility of letting us do some things, it's uh, it's definitely great to be able to have people like you who are looking to kind of get things back to kind of their true breeding forms. In that same kind of idea of how things were better in the past, if we go back to kind of the, uh, the super skunk and where it originated from the SSC, do you think that like breeding was so much better back then that like the the clone that is now that was the super skunk that was just kind of a common occurrence like if you got a couple packs of ssc you would likely find something that good or do you think it was like a one in a million thing because these days to get a clone only it's considered like one in a million but back in the day people talk of ssc for example as though like it was just a common thing well uh yeah, I do. I think that well, I what I, my take on it is is that when the man traveled around the world and he collected all this stuff for our enjoyment to 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 make his business and to break that catalog, I think what he what he was finding was what evolution, you know, God knows I, the, what I the, the way I the way I kind of the, the way I look at what helps me kind of put it in a in a visual picture is imagine going to Afghanistan right and and. During, by the way, not to mention during the the so, the U the Soviet invasion, and teaming and you know kind of befriending like you know guys who are hiding in a mountain or like their life is war, mm. and their families are producing hash and cannabis to survive, right? And they are doing breeding. They're breeding up there. They're making seeds for every year, just like farmers have been doing for thousands of years. And somehow this man, you know, befriends these people to the point where he takes them to their village, to their homes, and to their staff spot, and they've given things to take out into the world. I mean, so I think that maybe just by default, I think that uh, the people that were, you know, were all these original land race strains or whatever you want to call them, I think that the, the, the people who were caretaking them for them for God knows how long, their families have been taking care of them for hundreds of years, maybe, who knows, you know, for as long as you can imagine. I mean, I went to Ireland once, and I went to the Guinness factory, and, you know, they showed us the vase, where they, the, I'm sorry, the uh, the safe where they keep their uh, their yeast strain. And yeah, it's the, the same starter. thing, it's the same idea. We, yeah, the starter, and they have the same one going back to the beginning of the Guinness brewery or to the last fire or whatever, and it, and they keep it under safe keeping, you know, and it's they built their business and their you know, people all over the world drink Guinness beer for whatever it's worth, and uh, it all comes from that strain of yeast that they have there at their at their facility. So I feel like I look at that the cannabis went through the same thing. It just didn't have the benefits of of uh, safes in Dublin, Ireland. It had the benefits of you know maybe arm you know dudes not Afghanistan who you know were trying to keep their families fed and do something that their fathers or, or mothers showed them and grandfathers or mothers showed them. So I think that breeding had been done. It was just done differently. It wasn't like on this fast-paced thing, like trying all, everything you can and hoping that you catch the right thing that we're, we're kind of caught up now. It was more of like, you know, this this village and family was isolated from this family and village, so maybe they just never crossed their, their strains. They just the, the families were working on their own thing. You know, maybe they had products that their own, that whatever, who, however it was working, whether they were consuming themselves or, selling it more likely and making hash with it and selling it more likely, you know, they were looking for traits. And so they were breeding, you know, just yeah. like humans have learned how to do for years. So, and I think that when the world got smaller and everything got moved around, you know, I think we did what we w- would normally do. We would try to f- take two of our favorite things and cross them together and make something better. And the results have been, you know, they've been kind of hit or miss and a lot of miss, you know? So I think that, you know, when 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 I was young and throughout my life, you know, I've I've smelled cannabis and tasted cannabis, and there's traits that I fell in love with, and that's imprinted in my head. It's imprinted in my brain, just like every other, you know, pothead. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm, I'm I I have those those things in there. When I come across, like I talked about the Beatrix Choice earlier, I actually that friend that I befriended uh, uh, that I ran back into in life lately. He actually gave that back to me. And so I just took it down for the first time. And I'm trying to, now I'm going through files in my memory from 1992 was the last time I smoked that stuff, you know. 
I got a sack of it as I was going up to Buffalo, New York to, to the summer tour. And it was the last sack of it I ever got. It was my favorite, my favorite weed when I was a kid growing up in Virginia. And now I'm just sitting here going, is it it? I'm, I'm smelling it. I'm looking at it. And it, it's got like a heavy grape, like artificial grape bubblegum flavor to it, which I love that. Excuse me. That um, just makes my mouth water. I love it. Yeah. And I haven't smoked it yet because it's, it's drying right now, but I'm smelling it. And I'm like, I sure shit smoke grape bubblegum in here. I sure shit do. Now, it doesn't look like it to me, but my memory of what it looked like, I just don't have a very – uh, you know, develop memory that I have a more developed memory of the flavor of it. So I, I'm really excited. I can't wait to smoke it. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's kind of an example I'm talking about is taking those, those memories of those traits where I formed the opinion that, yeah, that was better than what we got today and trying to like recreate that, you know, just based off of memory. Cause that's what, well, that's all I got, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if it's going to work out. I guess the world, I mean, you, you'll have to tell me. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. <laughs> So far, so good. Don't worry. I'll, I'm, I'm keen to grow it out, so I'll be sure to let you know. Um, so, did right. you ever happen to uh, have any run-ins with the infamous roadkill skunk? Well, Duke. Do we call him Duke? Is that what we like to call him? Yeah. Okay. He, he, he's he been talking to me about the roadkill skunk, and I never really heard anyone call anything particular growing up in Virginia the roadkill skunk. Now, we had, like, skunk number one. And then we had what they called the basic five, if I recall. That was the heavy yeah. skunk one, the super skunk. And then we had the northern lights, which the northern lights to me, if I had to say the chem, like people will compare the chem dog to the OG Kush in, other, in, in ways and say they must be related. I don't really feel that way. I don't feel like I see – I don't get the impression there's a direct relationship between the two. Um, my buddy swears to God that the OG Kush came from a bag of my, like a bag seat out of one of my units years ago. And I, I laugh at him every time I hear that, but I don't, I just don't, I don't really feel that, that they're that connected, but this Northern lights that I used to smoke that came out from the catalog. Um, I want to say Northern lights number five, but I don't really know if that's what it was. We just called it Northern lights. It had that same color as the chem dog and it's had that loud, like molecule, penetrating smell that the chem dog has so whenever whenever when i first smoked the chem dog i immediately that memory of that northern lights popped up you know that we used to smoke and uh so you know it had that same color i don't even know where i was going with that but um what was your question again i'm sorry <laughs> did you ever get to run across the roadkill skunk no no I, I never actually ran anything called the roadkill skunk in my life i have the dude kind of turned me on to that that term and uh he talks much about it and he's told me a lot about it you know and uh for the skunks when i was a kid the super skunk was at the very top of the list mainly because you had more exposure to it and then right after that if you were lucky the, the basic skunk or the or the skunk five i think is what they called it and um and then there was a skunk number one which was similar to the basic five or whatever but those were pretty much the skunk strains when i was that i've been uh that I've been around and exposed to. Yeah, no worries. So if we keep with that same theme of like kind of comparing some of the older strains to some of the new ones, um, on your Instagram, there was a nice frosty looking photo of some Girl Scout cookies, but one of the hashtags you used was hashtag yawn. Is this kind of a bit of a reference to how you feel about some of the new strains versus the older ones? Do they stand up or the old ones just crush them? I think that, I think that I don't understand how the Girl Scout cookie got so popular. I really don't. I, to me, I think I've peaked it. I've grown it, and I've peaked it out, you know. And my friend at IC Collective, he made the uh, the Chem Scout, which it got really popular really quick, especially here in the Bay Area. Uh, he won a cup with it and stuff like that. I like that one better. Of course, it has some Chem Dog in it, but it's really, really much more similar to the Girl Scout with just a lot more – just a – uh, I want to say a lot. It's got a couple more notes of odor to it and, and flavor too. I just, uh, I just never was impressed with that one. I, that one, like, I think you, I'm sure, you know, it is like when it hit the streets here in California, it just was like, wow. You know, like, you, you know, you were selling units. Someone would, could be sell units like on the wholesale market for say in California here, they were getting like 22 to 26, but they, at, there was a period a couple years ago or two years even where the Girl Scout was, on that same 
market going to 35 and i was like wow i can't wait to see this stuff finally a great stream let's see it you know because <laughs> people show you streams you know and you're like well that's really nice and then you pull out a sack of chem dog and they're like holy shit you know they're like wow that's like 10 times better than this or it's just so much better it's like <laughs> you know so i couldn't wait to see it and I, I gotta be honest i was disappointed with it it's just not it's not my it's not that i don't think it's good i understand it's good i i actually think it's great for the daytime if you got you know business meetings or whatever people do in the daytime but i think that uh i don't where's the taste where's the smell i don't really get it you know i'm, I'm, I'm missing something there you know i feel like i've made up traits to justify keeping it in my life you know and uh <laughs> That's that's not what I'm going for. That's a great great example, you know. But yeah, that's exactly what that was. It's just like pff, whatever, you know. I don't get it, you know. It's not. But everyone's got their own. I respect and understand, and it's clearly seeing that everyone's got their own opinions about these things. And Blue Dream, that's another one. It's like I, I mean, I'm not going to smoke that. You know what I mean? I got I, I got so much space in my lungs for smoke in my lifetime here. However long I get to be here, and I'm not going to waste it on. Weed, it doesn't have a good taste to it. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> half the reason I smoke weed is the flavor. I love the flavor. That's really the main thing I, I get out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can completely agree with that. So, I guess just to be fair, um, what would you say are some of the downsides of the 91 then? Like, we've already brought up that she's, you know, she's inconsistent and things like that. Um, one thing that's commonly brought up is she herms, and you know, because a lot of famous strains are born from that. How easy is she to actually herm? Is she like any other strain where, like, you do need to actually stress, or is she quite temperamental? I would say that, like I said, the first time I grew it was in nineteen ninety five. I think, I think the first bit I smoked was uh, the first first week in Jan- the first week in January of ninety six, and I found a seed in there, and it was there was no seed in the super skunk, but there was a seed in the uh, in the chem dog. And I'm, when I say a seed, I'm saying, like, that was, like, one or two or three. It was very – and it was shocking to me because I was learning at the time, and I was like, oh, my God, what did I do wrong? I, I He explained to me everything about how Hermes happened, you know, everything we knew at the time. And I went through my whole process. Do I got a lay leak in here? I mean, what, what's going on? Do I have enough airflow? Is there, are we choking in here? What's going on? And it just – I think I had – I think I had seeds in every single – and I'm saying, like – say you had five pounds of weed, you'd find five seeds, you know, very, very. And then every now and again, you would see one bud that would have just be, I would say full of seeds, but relatively speaking, you know, 10 seeds in a bud. And you're like, holy shit, what happened here? And then you start, you know, going through the whole thing and seeing where else they are. And then you never find another one. So, um, I usually don't ever see the males, the, the Hermy flowers. I, it's very rare that I actually see the Hermy flowers. It's usually I see a seed, which I'm assuming there must have been a flower at some point. But I've tried to go through and, and see if I could find them to pick them off. And I've certainly found them in, like, dried flowers. I've, I've definitely a few times I've found them in there. But it must happen real quick, and they must go away real quick because it's really hard to see it happen. And, you know, I've, I've scoured them. But uh, the down points on the chem dog, you know, I mean, you could get that. I don't know. It depends, you know. Like, you know, if you get up in the morning and you smoke chem dog, rosin or dabs all day you know you're gonna you're gonna have it's it, it, for me personally that's kind of hard you know what i mean like to have to have a life and do that <laughs> it's really yeah. strong it's medicine and i've had lots of patients tell me that it, it you know people consume cannabis because they want to uh they're wasting away syndrome or they're having a heart you know just are stressful and they're having you know a lot of people when they get stressed out they can't eat they lose their appetite and they you know cannabis helps them with that I've had lots of patients over the years tell me that not only did this chem dog help with their appetite, but they really felt that it changed their metabolism and that they were able to put more weight on without eating much more food. You know what I mean? That Mm -hmm. their body's metabolism changed where it actually was converting energy to, you know, to store. So, you know, I don't know that I don't want to say that's a negative, but that's a, that's, that's not recreational. You know, when you, when people are, you know, feeling a little heavy on the front because they're smoking too much chem dog. And, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, as far as the traits of the plant itself and the buds go, she looks like a bitch to trim. I'm just going to say that. It, it, you know, if you get it right, it's, it's the worst thing I don't like is the foxtail thing. It's, yeah. it's doing that more 
the last few years than it used to do. It used to be more rounded. And whenever I see one of those rounded buds, I try to get a picture of it, you know, because it's tough for some reason to get them like that. I, I'm like, I always think I figure out what I can do to make it so they're consistently all that rounded top, which is just a lovely, you know, visually it's just lovely when it turns out like that. But um, I, I say that, like, you know, I've got it down to the point where, you know, they're minimal. But I don't like that, you know. And I wish that the one thing I've noticed with the chem dog is that what it's always done is that the it, it it has this funny thing. Like people will tell you, "Oh, the chem dog's done at day seventy nine. You can let it go further." In fact, when my friend gave it to me, he told me that you can let it go forever, but you sh- you can't. You got to take it at some time. So take it at day sixty three, and that seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to me. It's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. This plant can keep on getting better. The peak, no one really knows where the peak is. Well, you know, now we know where the peak is because we can test it. But, you know, it turns out the peak is way sooner, way sooner as far as the THC levels. And, oh, the the white hairs, you know, like, so what, it, what the chem dog will do is it'll look perfect on day 48, right? It'll look perfect, picture perfect. But obviously that's not, you know, it's not, you, you could take that and now you got, what, 19% THC. Who knows? I mean, you're not going to take it, right? Yeah. So you're trying to get a little closer to the peak, and you keep going. And then after day 48, it does a little fox tailing, and then it puts out a whole new set of white hairs, right? And yeah. I don't like that. It bugs me. That's the one thing I don't like about the chem dog. It really bugs me because, you know, I would have a lot more pictures to share with the chem dog. I just can never get happy with them because well, cause I'm weird, and I'm, and I'm like, you know, I don't know. I'm just kind of weird about it. I want it to look look perfect, you know? Yeah, you're a perfectionist. And, uh, I mean, you know, and uh, I'm a control freak for sure. <laughs> you know, I think every I think every grower is a control freak if they're what they're doing anyway, because that's what we're doing. And uh, but but uh, yeah, I don't like that because it, it visually it's hard. But by the end of the whole thing, I mean, when you, and and you dry it, and you cure it. I mean, there's there's nothing like it. I don't I don't have I I personally haven't smoked anything better than the chem dog or stronger or has a better flavor as she stands today. You know, that's my opinion, but that's the way I feel. And, um, you know, the, and the other thing is it's like, it's much harder to get the giant chunk nugs than it used to be. Certainly can do it, you know, certainly can do it. I just got 2.12. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I just got 2.12 pounds per a thousand watt light. And it was not because I, you know, was growing trees. It was because, you know, the buds were chunky, really nice shaped and they came out perfectly, you know? Sounds really good. So yeah, yeah. And, you know, when, when you smoke it, you know, like, uh, you know, my fiance, she smokes cannabis daily t- for her, for whatever reason she does. And, you know, we've got all kinds of weed around here and that jar is always the one that gets open. I mean, so she, she's not biased like me. She didn't <laughs> end dog till she met me. So she just, that's just her favorite one. You know, So, you know, I don't know. To me, it's still, I, I, I hope that we have one day soon just a catalog of strains that are on that level in my perception that that caliber, you know, you know, me and my buddy at IC collective, we were talking, we were saying, it's like, are we the only people who really love the chem dog or like what, you know, cause you know, <laughs> it just seems like it's sometimes like, are we in a bubble? Did we create a bubble where this is the queen of all cannabis? And that's just what we think. And we think the whole world agrees with us and, and but we're wrong. <laughs> you know? um, would you agree that, there has seemingly been more success breeding the chem dog as a hermy than as with a male. I mean, I know it's kind of early days, but it seems like whenever the chem throws some pollen, whatever it hits turns to gold. Whereas whenever you hit it with an act, hit like for example the ninety one with a male, it's maybe not as consistently producing really stellar clones. What do you think about that? I think that that's what I've seen. Um, you know, the, 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 I've been around a uh, pretty extensive chem dog feminizing project and, you know, feminizing the chem dog and hitting so many different strains. And they were all winners. I mean, it was off. It was I, 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 I don't think that that's how it normally pans out. You know, like like I said, the silver chem, the chem scout. The sky, the sky chem. I mean, that's the Skywalker with it. Then it was the uh, oh, geez. I mean, then there was, he did that that Sherbert. He crosses every single one of those. You know, randomly pick out five seeds out of a huge bag, and every single one of them you could keep. 
and does and the clubs that sell the top shelf in california and the bay area take it you know what i mean so like yeah uh it looks like to me like you know that has to be explored a little bit more in further you know and, and i don't really i i don't like i said i i'm not the one to be able to articulate the community's opinion on feminized seeds. You know, I'm I, the jury's still out on me. I haven't seen any problems. You know, that's the thing. I, I'm wondering what the because uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is uh, to me the, my understanding of the perception of feminized seeds is kind of a shaky thing where some people are like against it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, I would uh, I would agree. A lot of people seem to be against it, but I'm the same as you. I haven't really seen too many problems to be honest. I think a lot of the time people don't want to face their own growing problems yeah i think that's that is definitely you know i I, i've I've seen when i first got the chem d for an example you know i grew it like i was doing things at the time and at the time i was overfeeding my plants that that was just where i was at in my evolution you know i was the last person to uh to use uh in my circles to try to use any kind of salt mixtures you know and uh spaces and i overdid it until i understood you know where i think the, the sweet spot is and i got shit tons of hermy flowers on my chem d right now i don't get any hermes you know i don't have any hermes there's no literally no hermes on on the chem d that i grew recently you know so i'm using it as an example that uh, growing methods have a lot more to do with that than i think people realize or give give credit for you know yeah um i like I said, you know, I've I've been around this this project and I'm watching it unfold and I'm watching the seeds as they. I'm talking. I've been watching it for three years now, and and watching the seeds come out and they're, you know the chem scout did. They're, they're, we were suspicious the chem scout was creating some hermy, but you know the chem dog was always in there and that definitely certainly for surely puts you know some some uh, hermy banana type flowers out so. You know, I never saw one on the Kim Scout, and and it, and even then, even in that case, we when I was helping my friend get to the bottom of things, we did find a, a problem in his in, in a section of his grow room that could have been causing some extra stress. You know, there was a hot spot in the corner that wasn't getting the proper airflow, and you know, and I, we we know for sure that can cause a, a plant to uh, to try to propagate itself. You know, so yeah, um, I haven't seen it. It, it. To me, it's been like why not you know but um but but i i think my approach i'm gonna do both i'm gonna because i think there's a lot of promise there and i think you have way more control and i think that in some aspects you can you can actually go and get the traits you're looking for a little quicker than than going through the traditional methods yeah and um and so i'm gonna do both because i i my goal like i said is i want that male or those couple males that you know, it's like Guinness's yeast where that's okay. This is where, this is our base right here. From yeah. this point, everything either gets better or it goes away. It's not going to, we're not going to vary from this. I think as I'm learning to breed and I'm, and I'm learning, you know, I'm learning how, what, I mean, really it's just knowing the plant is I think is what breeding all it is. It's knowing the plant and being able to, at any point in the plant's life um, stages, in any stage of the plant's life, say, you know, I'm feeling like this plant's got this trait or this trait or that trait. You know, I think that's really what a good breeder can do really. You know I mean? What else is, what else are you really doing besides that? You know? Yeah. So, um, you know, in order for that to be successful at that, you got to really know the plant that you're working with. You got to really know it. You're not just met it, but really know it, you know? So I think for me, what I want to do is take that knowledge I have of my favorite strain, the chem dog and, and put it into seed form and, you know, and see where it goes from there, but make hybrids and eventually release back crosses with itself that are, you know, cubed to the point where it's guaranteed you're going to get what you want, you know, with very yeah. little variation. Yeah, for sure. So I guess uh, kind of my ultimate question in regards to the 91 in terms of both working and breeding with it is, do you think for this plant specifically, I think the answer might be a little different for other plants, but do you think for the 91 – working with it is more of an art or a science because it seems to not behave quite like the regular plant in some aspects let me think if i understand what you're saying there do you think do you think that um 
Yeah. So, do you think that like it, um, you can consistently get results from it, or do you think it's it's not the type of thing where you can have your kind of playbook and know if I do this, it'll do that? Do you think it's it's a bit unpredictable in some ways? I used to think that, and then as my understanding of what I'm actually doing, met whatever method I'm using at that time, um, I try different things at different times too. I don't always do the same thing. You know, I definitely feel like I've gotten a, um, you know, a, a process that is guaranteed to produce what you want. I don't really have very much variation anymore from cop to cop with chem dog. In the beginning, what my friend told me about the hit or miss and the stars, it definitely was true. But as time went on and my understanding, I want to say skills, but I don't really know if that word I don't know, applies to what I'm saying. But those, you know, learning uh, from my experiences and applying what I'm learning to what I'm doing, I think that just that kind of went away. It's very consistent now. It's consistent. It was, like I said, you know, I had these new ones, the Chem Crush. I had... uh you know, uh, a sour band in there, which is really phenomenal. And I had the Beatrix Choice and some Silver Chem on one side, say half that. And then on the other half, I had Chem Dog, and I crushed it on the Chem Dog side. You know, I got more of a yield on the Chem Dog side. You know, yeah. I got, you know, it's always better pot to me, so I'm not even going to say that. But, you know, it, it's very consistent, very nice. You know, it's tricky. It's very tricky plant. It, it's, uh, you know the nuts and bolts of it is it it, it 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 consumes itself at the end of its life. It really does, and and you have to let it do that because that's what it's going to do anyway. And you know, time is of the essence, and you know this is just the clock of the plant. But it's hard to watch. You know, it it consumes itself. You know, it takes every little bit of its nutrient out of its body and and eats it. You know, and, and you can watch it do it. It's very interesting, right next to it. And you're like, you know, if if you're the first time you ever come walking into a grow room, you're going to go and without using your nose. Okay, you're going to be like, what the hell happened to those plants? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then these over here, they're all lush and green and stuff. But you know, the Kim dog is just, you know, for whatever reason, and it does do that more than it used to. Going back to that question you asked earlier about the changes, it does do that more. Like uh, the best Kim dog I ever grew was organic, and I think the reason that was was be- is because <sighs> you're never ever really just running on water. You know, when you're doing it that with the method I used with that, I always had like this certain tea I was making this, like I used to make, this, uh, we didn't call it, um, compost teas. We called it the vat, the gay tea, the vat, the vat, you know, <laughs> and I had like, you all see these mixture. Back on it. yeah, it's like this, this is, this was the whole thing. You know, you take your back guanos, a couple different kind. You know, you take your seabird guano, high phosphorus, and your high phosphorus back guano. You put it in there with a little maxi crop. You know, uh, you add a little sugar, and then you put one of those, not just an air bubbler in the bottom, but and these things were really hard to get back then. It was really hard to find these, but I would go find these fish pond, or I'm sorry, uh, these big saltwater fish tank pumps where they actually suck the water up at a very high volume bring it up to the top of the pump head, which is kind of hanging on, say, like the edge of a trash can or whatever you got, the vat, you know, yeah. and uh, mixes it with air. And it actually had a tube going out of it. I think it's just like a – I don't know what they call them, but um, – and and the idea was it was creating like a, a vigorous, and a, a, you know, um, act, sucking action. So it's got – it's like agitating. That water's agitating, right? But it's yeah. adding air to it, right? This yeah. thing – when the power would go off, this would be the first thing that the generator would get. Or this would be the first thing that I'd plug into the generator was this pump, right? Because when this thing was humming, and I would never use more than half of it was the rule. And this is all the stuff my friend originally showed me. This is all his tricks. And it, man, it was, I got 72 ounces of chem dog off of two 1000s on light tracks one time. It was, <laughs> I, I brought everybody I knew over to my house. People drove from four hours away to come see these buds. You know what I mean? It was crazy. <laughs> but um, you You're know, I, I would go every time I water my plants. I would stick my hand in the vat, and I would only use this thing once every two weeks, right? And uh, and do a lot of top dressings, and I would take my hand, and I, you know, I'm I'm an electrician. I work with my hands. I'm always doing some sort of physical project, messing with tools. So I've always got some sort of nick on my hand, always, even right now. And I would take my hand, I would stir it up, and then by the time I would be done. By the time I'd water my plants, just with the with the regular regiment, the regular water, 
that little cut on my hand would be nice and red and looking like it's already infected just 20 minutes later. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, <laughs> all right, tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to use that. It's ready, you know? And then I would only use half of it. No matter how I had to, no matter how much I had to spread it, how many plants I had to spread it over, I would never use more than half of it, you know? And then I would fill it back up and I was very careful, of course, to make sure that the water was, you know, not, didn't have chlorine or anything like that. And it worked great. You know, it was basically some sort of compost tea action we were getting with it, you know. But um, but the inconsistency thing, it doesn't really happen anymore, you know. It just doesn't – it just it pretty much comes out the same. I'm not saying it looks as pretty on day 56 as the Silver Chem does, but it definitely – it's still my favorite, man. And a lot of people around me, it's their favorite one still, you know, so – yeah, cool. So if we keep on that same topic of like a kind of technology in the garden, um, how, what are some updates? What are you running nowadays? Have you converted over to our, you know, your Nanolux slash Gavita double M bulbs or are you still a simple man with just your, your tents and your HIDs? No, I, I am using the, uh, not the Gavitas, but I'm using the, uh, um, the, the Hydro Farm, what are they called? Phantoms. Same, same, same thing, yep. double-ended thing. Yeah. It's just a little different of a – I didn't have – you know, the reason I'm doing that is that they have the right hood, I guess you'd call it, you know, the insert, the reflector. They have the right reflector um, for my space. I, don't, I can't go up. I can't raise like I would need to for the Gavitas to get that high over the canopy. So I use this other one. It's just a more open pattern. And then I put it on light movers just because, uh, I mean, why not, you know? And, yeah. uh, and it seems to work really good. It takes the shadows out. And I've always had, I've always really liked those things. I, I, I got away from using them. I started off with them, and, and I really like them because, you know, it, you know, you, you see some of these, these – I don't really have the type of grower. I, I, it's a small thing that I have, and I can't, like, cover the whole thing with light. There's going to be an aisleway over here. There's going to be a cabinet over here. So, you know, I use the light movers to kind of try to compensate for that. Uh, lack of total coverage I've got, you know? Yeah. So, but, uh, besides that, you know, I do different things at different times, you know, it depends on what it is, you know, we do, sometimes we're doing a little organic and sometimes we're doing a little, mostly some, some custom salt mixes we've got going on and, you know, just you know, over the course of the bunch of years, you know, you just, you, some things work and some things, some things help you out and some things are just literally a waste of money, you know? And, yeah. uh, and, and I've, I, I, anybody out there who's growing or learning, I, I, the only thing I could tell you is less is more and, and keep it simple, you know, cause it's, it's really, it, they call it weed for a reason. <laughs> you don't really have to do that much to it. You know, it's like, <laughs> you just got to give it a little food and, and enough to, you know, tell it what time it is. And, and that's pretty much it, you know? And then I think that, I think most of the skill when it comes to growing cannabis isn't, uh, what you feed, what your plant, your, 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 you know, your regimen is or whatever. I think it's really on how you train your plants and how you treat them in an indoor situation, especially. I think it's how you train your plants and, you know, how you shape them. I like to say, or sculpt them, you know, yeah. to get them to where they're going to bring you the most for their little space that they're going to have with the idea that that lights directly above them and not to the side and, you know, it's not going to move from this point in the sky as the season changes. It's always in the same spot. With that all taken into consideration, I think that that is the thing that you can, you know, give yourself better results with more than anything else that I've seen. You know, I don't really see, you know, people going, oh, I'm using this and now look what happens. Wow. I don't see that a lot. I see people use what they feel comfortable with, their, their you know, recipes, their regiments, you know, their you know, Duke, he uses all kinds of stuff over there. He tells me things. I'm like, you do what now? <laughs> you know? it's, I love it. He's, I love that guy. He's, I've met him recently in life. and I, He's fucking, he, he, he's an interesting cat. I like him. I like his attitude. And I love his story. And I can tell he's good people. And, uh, but yeah, he, he tells me some stuff. I'm like, you do what? Like, Man, that sounds like something I would eat. Shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, but like I said, I, I think it mostly has to do with, with uh, remembering that you're in a sprint when you're growing cannabis. You're not in a marathon. You don't get today twice. You only get today once. So if you didn't do today what had to be done, you don't get to do it tomorrow. You just missed it, and maybe you should jot it down and make sure you didn't miss it. Next time you get a chance, make sure you do it, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And and then along with that, just, you know, keep it simple and 
and like you know watch your plants and see 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 which way they're what they're trying to tell you and you know they respond quick you know they don't they don't it's not like you have to wait half your life to figure out what you did work you know you got you got a short period of time you're going to find out what your results are and and you know, be keep your mind open and and uh and really look at everything you're doing you know don't, don't turn your eyes away from some things because you thought it worked in the past you yeah. know keep it all on the table in front of you and try to make sure that you're you're fine tuning everything not just one aspect like am i feeding my plants the right thing i see so many people that get caught up in that and i just think it's like it's a dead end it doesn't really matter that much really you know you know you can use any of the tools that are available to us and we got so many of them and if you learn how to use them properly i would imagine that you know you're going to get good results if everything else is working like I, my buddy said it's light air and water and food that's it <laughs> it's no more complicated than that you know I mean? yeah so um for this next part, we just might move on to some kind of less growing based questions, some kind of more cannabis scene slash community related questions. Um, were you uh, quick to jump on to the as like a medical patient or were you kind of a bit hesitant and you just kind of did your own thing without really engaging in the medical community so much? And furthermore, do you think that the kind of the medical scene in America is working for the people in general? Well, me, I, uh, I, I'm kind of hardcore about all that. When I, when I, I, when two fifteen, I remember when Proposition two fifteen, when the petition was being passed around. I remember I went in front of this gross uh, Safeway or something, and this guy asked me if I wanted to sign it, and I said, I said no, and he goes, why not? And he goes, because I think it should be legal for everybody. I don't think you should have to be sick. Because in my mind, I was like, you know, and that was a really foolish thing. That was when I look back, that was some serious dumb youth right there. But that's, that's how I felt about it. I was like, you know, it should be legal for everybody. And so when proposition 215 happened, I think we all, no matter what our feeling on it was, I think that the way that the proposition was written, I think it was amazing because it was so basic and simple and it was so vague that it could be interpreted to mean basically that, you know, the, 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 there was no limits, you know. It was just not not plant limits. There was just no limitations to this. The way they were. it was so masterfully vague, you know. So I think that we all rejoiced when that happened. I mean, it was like I think it was uh, an amazing moment. And I don't think that me personally, I don't think I took it in for what it was worth at the time. And the reason being is because I feel like I just didn't believe it. I just did not believe that that's really how it was, you know. Until um, I was at a concert down in the South Bay, and we had a quite a who's who of people with cannabis came to a, a, a suite we had there one night in uh, Santa Clara, California, and uh, I think we were at a Shoreline show. And, it, and this is, you know, this was just like in two thousand two or three. This is much farther after Jerry died. You know, this is after kids and everything, and. We were all settled down, but we were anyways, we're at this hotel and we were smoking and it was definitely getting a little hairy. And my friend had just given me this, uh, this, uh, one of these hand blown on a lathe glass, you know, glass pipe bongs, you know, like the, the ones that they spin on the lathe. Very nice piece, you know? Yeah. And so we're looking at that and then, then we have a, the, the guy with the bubble hash shows up. This is the first guy that ever showed me bubble hash. He shows up and he's got his full melt and we're just smoking and it's just one after another. Next thing you know. It's just me and my buddy in the room, and the kids are in the back room, and it's separated. We have a door that's separated, and they're asleep. And then we get a, that knock at the door. You know what I mean? Crack, crack, crack. We're like, oh, God. Sure enough, the police are out there, and someone had complained. You know, we're, we're you know, we come from a place where it's really not that big a deal up in Sonoma County. I mean, you can, you can smoke weed pretty much in public like you can in San Francisco almost now. But uh, we're not there. We're in Santa Clara. It's a much more conservative place. And, Sure enough, there was some police at the door, and we opened the door, and I went outside, and they're like, we're coming in. I'm like, not without a warrant. We go through this whole thing, and next thing you know, I'm in handcuffs sitting on the floor, and they're searching the room, and they find some pot, and they find a, a you know, maybe a scale or something like that. And it was nothing much, it was, but it was a big deal to them, you know. Yeah. And uh, they arrest me, and, and, uh, and, you know, the next thing I know, I'm sitting, in, you know, later that week, I'm sitting in front of an attorney, and the first question she asked me is, so do you have your Proposition 215? 
<laughs> and I'm like, I mean, it was like the most embarrassing moment of my life, I think, practically. And I said no. And she's like, well, and she's very professional. She's like, well, can I ask you why? And I was like, it hit me right then. I was like, this is a real thing. Like, I'm, I'm sitting in front of an attorney that I just paid money. And her question to me is, why don't you have your 215? Like, I'm paying her to ask me this. You know? And I'm like, <laughs> what, what a fool I am. You know what I mean? And I mean, I got little pot plants. And, and I got, a, you know, my garden, of course. And I got a couple of the outdoor in the garden at the house, you know, and at the time. And I don't know. I feel like a fool. So it, this was like in, you know, Proposition 215 was in 1996, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't get my medical until... I was in 1999, so that was a good three years later, and it, that's how it happened. She basically, you know, was like, you know, you need to go see a doctor, and you know, I'm like, well, I don't really, I'm not sick, and she goes, look, you don't understand how it works. It's not, you don't have to be sick. Do you use it for anything besides like you just get stoned? I said, no. I mean, I mean, you know, traffic irritates me. I smoke weed, you know. You know, like life gets to me. I mean, she goes, that's, that's a reason. That's it right there. Go see a doctor. And to me, it was such an alien idea. So I went and saw the doctor. He talked to me and he's like, you know, he asked me all the questions. How much do you smoke? What do you smoke it for? And I tell him, and then I, and I suddenly felt like a patient, you know, and I was like, and I was like <laughs> it felt legit. And then we, we took all this to the, to the, you know, we, she did her thing, you know, I don't, we didn't go to court or anything. And, you know, they, they ended up dropping the charges and all that kind of stuff. So that's how it happened for me. It was. You know, I've, 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 uh, you know, in my, my years traveling around the Grateful Dead and everything else associated that we, we learned how to survive in the shadows in America, you know, and, and I kind of got comfortable there. And I think that, I think even as things are, you know, as we're recreations coming online here in America, I think I'm still dealing with that a little bit because sometimes I see what people are doing out there and I'm like, God dang, man, you guys are over the top. And you know what? They're they're actually really successful, and they're putting their dreams together because they came out of the shadows to do that. And that's, I, I struggle with that, you know. So I think that when I that's, it took me a while to get my medical because of that. So, and I think as far as medical in America, mm, I want to say yes, but I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if I have the whole view on that because of um, my lack of really understanding completely what how cbd works and how it helps people with various things and, and not just my lack of understanding just in general so my answer would be that it would be great if we would just open this up and 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 uh in america here and 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 try to figure out what is helping people in a in situations a b and c and and, and try to understand it because you know that's how i i think that you know i just want to see everything from a science-based point of view when it comes to the medical side of cannabis, like what exactly does this help? But being careful with, you know, we're getting pretty far away in America here from just remembering that it's just a fucking plant, you know, like, you know, everyone's so hype, hyped up on, yeah, yeah, regulate, tax the cannabis, you know, producer like you do an alcohol producer. And, you know, I, I, and then that brings up that same kind of militant, attitude i have in me is like it's not like alcohol it's a plant it's different it's like it's more like valerium or it's more like you know you know it's more like an herb or something it's not like alcohol alcohol is poison you know i mean yeah you know i like glass of wine but i don't want it to get and if and if and since we're already on this road because you know reality is reality since we're already on this road where we're going to regulate it tax it like alcohol that's the phrase that people are comfortable with okay well then treat me like uh you know treat me like a small brewery treat me like a uh, a winery or something you know don't treat me like i'm making meth or something you or making like you know oxycodone in my basement you know what i mean yeah. like treat me like i'm i'm making out that's what you're going to do and let me have the same rights as those people do because they got plenty of rights i i live in wine country i see how what they get away with you know what i mean and uh or you know, just let people leave it be like it's a tomato plant, you know, which is what I would prefer if they would just leave it alone and let, let the market sort itself out, you know. Yeah. But um sorry, so I was gonna say, so what yeah. are some of the uh the the pitfalls that um other countries could learn from America? Like surely there were some things that happened after legalization which in retrospect you realize were negatives, but maybe initially you thought they were positives. Like what what should we be on the lookout for? 
That's a good question. Um, well, see, I guess it, when when you ask that, that what comes to mind is uh, dispensaries. Um, I mean, that's just that's just part of the fabric now. That's part of the scene now. But in the beginning, and even the people who wrote Proposition Two Fifteen, that's exactly what they didn't want. You know, they knew that if if we allowed if if we allow people to so, you know, cannabis in like a dispensary uh, situation, that's exactly where the federal government would get involved right there. You know, right when you do that transaction, that, that, that they would have a problem with that, you know. And they never intended, and actually my doctor was uh, in the room when they were brainstorming 215. And he explained this to me. And he said that, uh, you know, we never intend, we never saw that happening. We assumed that then when he said when I say we I'm talking like I'm him, he, he said we never thought that that would happen. We thought that as soon as that happened, and we that the feds would shut it down, and that wouldn't be a problem. And that what we would be left with is, you know, farmers market type things, exchanges, and and but mainly everyone having the right to grow their own pot. You know, that was really the main goal. So I think that, you know, as, as when legalization happens, the you know, the, that. They weren't being realistic, in my opinion, because, you know, not everybody can grow their own. You know, I mean, that's just that they, they, most people can't. They don't have the space. They don't have the physical capabilities, especially if they're a medical patient. They don't have they don't they don't want to learn new skills just to get something that they've been using their whole life. You know what I mean? Just because the law says that's what you have to do now. Um, but I think as when legalization happens in places where it's beginning to happen and hasn't even gotten this far, like maybe where you're at or anywhere else, I think just keeping an eye on that, you know, making sure that the structure of how cannabis gets from the grower to the end user, just making sure that that's done right and don't don't let any because that's where all the shady the shady characters have popped into this industry, you know. Um, in my opinion, I think that that. The lure and and that whole infrastructure and apparatus has allowed the people who really just want in for the money. That's given them the door, and you know, you know they they've controlled they they that basically gave them the keys to the market. You know, they decide how much pot costs. You know, and uh, I don't I don't really think that's I don't I think that could have been we've gotten away with it here and it went okay, but I think that part could be definitely organized better as it's growing in a place where marijuana has become legal. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So um, just touching back on a point you made earlier on, in terms of uh, how you were saying we need to figure out whether it's, you know, maybe the THC or the CBD, for example, which is actually giving the medicinal benefit. On your, it, just in your personal experience, and I know you mentioned earlier your fiancé uses for medical reasons, do you find that the high THC strains are actually, for the most people, the most effective? Because what we're seeing in Australia, for example, is that there's a big push to tell people that CBD is what's the benefit out of marijuana and that THC is just this recreational side component that you don't really need, you know, like, do you feel like that's a total misrepresentation? Absolutely. I, I think that there's no possible way that anyone could hundred percent tell you exactly what any given individual, whether it be a kid with seizures or someone who's going through chemo, what they're getting what in cannabis is giving them the benefit? I, I think that it's an entourage effect. I think is what we the, we agree the phrase we agree on. Yeah. And I think that there's simply and now with the introduction of 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 you know us breaking all the terpenes and isolating them all out and understanding that like these are powerful powerful substances terpenes terpenoids and and we and now we're trying to fit that into the puzzle. So we started off with taking the THC out. You know, you got, yeah, I mean, I don't know anybody who's ever used Marinol and been raving about it, you know. So that's not what it was. And then and then the, the CBD, and you think, oh, man, we just saved the whole world with CBD. And now that's turning out not to be the case when we isolate it and give that to people. It certainly helps with certain things. I mean, there's there's some other gray areas here that I'm not covering or, or probably even aware of. But I think that the whole plant concentrated or just the whole plant consumed, I think, seems to be the universal you know, uh, kind of helps with everything, if you know what I mean. Like, it seems to me that the people who have the access to the high THC stuff, they seem to be the ones that rave the most to me 
in my experience from what I hear, my perception to me about the benefits that they're getting from it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Completely. So I think that, I think that that's a big misconception. I think that THC is a it's very important part of it. And I think that it goes back to what I said. I think that, you know, these things need to be broken down in a scientific way and understood before we start telling anybody anything about what, you know what I mean? In the meantime, millions of people are having positive effects on their life from smoking cannabis. So they should, in the meantime, while well, the government catches up to society, which is basically what we're waiting for is, you know, just the other day in the United States, I'm sure you know that the DEA, after a bunch of fanfare this summer, they decided, and, and, and I got to say, like, how did, how did my democracy turn into a place where some bureaucracy decides what's dangerous and what's not? Isn't that, I mean, couldn't we have at least have a vote on that in Congress or something? <laughs> but, yeah, you know, this that's the way where we're at. And they just denied, they just, you know, almost in a joke, you know, came out and said that they still think that there's zero medical benefit to this and they're going to keep it remain. They're going to keep it under schedule one, you know, as opposed to schedule two, which would be a recognition. Cocaine isn't schedule two, you know, yeah. in America. They think that that has a medical benefit as whereas cannabis doesn't along with heroin and PC and LSD, for instance, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's you know, insane. it's just so it's, we're so our, our research and our, Main, and especially our government is is keeping this stuff moving at such a pace. I don't know if we'll ever know what what the deal is with cannabis and and what it's trying to help us with and and what the what the the goal is here with that plant, you know, and and really break it apart. I mean, here in America, that's what we're good at. I mean, I th- I feel like that's what we've been always doing. You know, like we take something and we get down to the bottom of it scientifically. We always have in the past. That's what we like to take tell ourselves when we. When we look at our history, you know, like we got, we put the man on the moon, we figured it out, you know? And, uh, so, you know, I, I would love to see us go in that direction. I just don't see it happening. And it's, you know, for obvious reasons, because it's more profitable right now to cage humans than it is to, you know, take less med take, take people's medicine cabinets and empty them and, and, and putting a, a plan in there instead, you know? for many, many different things. It's just, so for some reason, it makes more sense to society right now uh, officially to demonize this and continuously put people in cages and lawyers and judges and cl- clerks and the whole the whole thing. And, you know, I just don't think that... I, I Like, Florida comes to mind, the way, what they're doing in Florida when you talk about the CBD thing, that they're trying... There's a lot of states where... And at the beginning, it was a warm, fuzzy thing. Well, we're, we're going to have CBD, like South Carolina for all places. They, you can, you can have CBD oil there. You can even import it into the state. I understand my, my family, some of my family lives there. That's why. And it's like the most backwards conservative place. And then Florida and Georgia. And to me, it's like, they're jumping the gun. I understand what they're doing. And I, and I, I respect that they're trying to help. You know, I think that the, the, when a, when a small child is having seizures and, is having a horrible life. It compels even these guys who can't see past their own biases towards this plant. They can see past it just enough to help those people, but they're making laws, you know, and those laws will have to be changed. They're going to have to be, you know, uh, rearranged. They're going to have to be, you know, revisited at some time in the future as the science comes out. So, you know, I just think you got to be cautious with that, you know, because we don't really know, you know, THC is, it's powerful medicine and you know, it's, it's our bodies receives it well. So it's gotta be something to it. Right. Yeah. So do you think that, um, for new countries that are just kind of writing their own legislation, do you think that the most important thing to maintain is that you need to be able to grow your own medicine or do you think that, um, you know, it, it's maybe okay to forego that right just to be able to, say, get it from, say, a mass supplier? Because just for, to give some context to this question, uh, Australia currently, the model proposed is looking like you won't be able to grow it yourself, but, you know, some big Philip Morrison tobacco conglomerate will probably be producing a ton of it. Do you think that we should compromise for that or that at the end of the day, growing your own needs to be the end goal? I think that... Well, and you're and you're saying that the, the, they're talking about doing this in the medical aspect, not recreational. Yeah, sorry, no, no recreational, only medical. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, 
I, and as I get older, I'm more this way. I, I truly believe that self-reliance is, is one of the highest of human qualities, you know, like, uh, growing your own food and making sure that your, your location, the place where you call home has good, clean source of water and figuring out how to make it clean if it's not clean and growing your own cannabis is part of that. So I, I can't see it any other way. I cannot, I, you know, companies that you're speaking of like that, not just Philip Morris and those types of companies, but even like just bigger companies that provide things that people use every day in life, say food and things like this. I, I'm it, to me, it's really important to get away from all that and to find more local sources uh, and, and more importantly, produce things that you can for yourself, you know, because I think that I just think that if we all do that life, the, the machine slows down to the point where we can maybe have a sustainable spaceship here on earth, you know, and that if, if people spent more time trying to take care of their more basic needs on their own, not like, Oh no, you've got to take care of that. Not, not, not in a mean way, but like, as in, this is what I'm, you know, this is what we want our society to be like people, you know, families take being self-reliant, you know, and, and, and learning how to like be healthy and feed themselves without, help from the companies, the corporations and the government and, and all that. So with that in mind, there's no other way for me to think about it. I, I really think that cannabis plant is no different than a tomato plant and that you should be able to grow either one. It's just something you're consuming. You know what I mean? But yeah. with, with that being said, the reality of it is, is that, like I said before, not everybody's going to be able to do that for various reasons. And I think, you have to have that right to do that, though. I feel like you have to. You have to. It's just a plant. And and by the way, if if you have a system where you're not allowed to grow, but you can buy it from whatever, people are still going to grow. So what did you really accomplish? You know what I mean? You just made some more laws. You just you just in, without even trying, you just made some more penalties for people in life. You know, because people are still going to grow their own pot. You know, I can I can get you know, shit. I don't even know where I'm trying to think of. A good example, eggs, right? I can get eggs from the factory farm at the sa- at the store, but I have my own chickens, and I get my eggs from own chickens, so I can eat GMO-free ch- eggs. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. should have that right. You know, I shouldn't have to be forced to go deal with some company that has different values than me, you know? Yeah, exactly. So if we just kind of really – sorry, go on. I was just saying I think that's really important, actually. I think that's really important to fight against that, and, it, and I think that – they're, they're just that one little addition to what I was saying. I don't think that you should make that compromise. I really don't. I think that, you know, here in California in 2010, we had a legalization thing. I think it was called Proposition 10 or 20 or something. I can't remember. But it failed. And it failed because it was wrong. It, it, it legalized cannabis, but it also created other laws that were more penalties for things that people were doing. Like, for instance, there was, uh, there was some sort of clause in there where you had to have your you know, your cannabis, there was extra, there was new penalties, uh, for, for people who had their children around their cannabis grows or cannabis situation in some way. And it, and it, it lost, you know, it surprisingly lost because, you know, the voters of California look, took all this into account and many people in California grow cannabis, as you know, and, and it failed because, you know, we couldn't make those compromises just to have legalization. We just couldn't do that. And now here again with AUMA, uh, Proposition 64 coming in November, you know, it's not doing so well in the community because people are having the same kind of questions. They're like, does this protect the small growers or not? And, and the, the answer is really unclear. So you go to where the money is and who the backers are, and it gets even more unclear. So now we don't know. And I do see, you know, to your point of the question that, you know, there is a compromise that has to be made. I mean, you have to like, you know, you, you you're, there's going to be a compromise. There's going to be winners. There's going to be losers. But we don't want to see new penalties. And I think that anything that says you can't grow is a terrible idea because it's you're really you're really just creating more criminals when you do that. You know, if you can't grow plants, you're creating an environment where there's criminals. You know, and when I say criminals, I mean dudes like me. I ain't a criminal, but you know, people who are breaking the law. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. And so this is kind of a little bit of left field question, but. I wanted to ask, what's your thoughts on the concentration community and maybe the possible kind of uh, negative impact they have on our image? In our last episode, Duke uh, referenced that, you know, 
some of the people who are, you know, really heavily onto concentrates these days more resemble crack addicts than marijuana users. Do you think that that's potentially like a negative thing or do you think on the whole we should just try to push the stoner image and make it more mainstream? Hmm. I know what you're saying about the image and um, I, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of funny too. Um, I, it's big. It's gotten big. It's kind of hard to, I don't even know if I've put my whole opinion on this yet. I don't think I've even formed my whole opinion, but I think that, you know, it, it, it's, that's, that's not going away. I can tell you that much. It might get more refined and better processes and, and, and standards, but it's not going away. That's definitely a popular thing. You know, I, uh, I smoked the rosin. I really like that. And that's, it's not because of any, it's not like I'm anti solvent or anything like that. It's just, I really love, it goes back to being self-reliant. You know what I mean? Like I don't have time to make a hash oil or anything like that. No, I don't really have a desire to, I've, I've messed around with it. And it's not that interesting to me, really. Like, I feel like the ceiling of of what captivates my imagination about learning something new, was, it, I hit it really quick. It was like, oh, okay. And um, so rousing is like a self-reliant thing. I mean, I love the fact that I can take my favorite strain. Instead of smoking someone else's trim that's been made into a concentrate, right? Or even, luckily, if you're lucky enough, smoking their fresh frozen live resin, I think they call it, they've made into a concentrate, which I love that stuff, you know? Yeah. And there's some amazing products coming out that are just mind-boggling. It's like, wow, this tastes so good. How did you do this? And then, um, but I love the fact that I can just take one of my own buds, stick it in some paper, and, and smush it, and then do a dab. Because I really like the ritual of doing a dab. I enjoy that. It's something I've learned I enjoy. And I, I don't like smoke. Um, I, I, I'm really, I have a really strong, I feel like I have a really strong sense of smell. And smoke, even cannabis smoke, it, it, it aggravates me. It really, I had allergies in the spring, and, and um, so I got like a sensitive, I feel like, a respiratory system. And smoking anything is not my favorite thing to do. You know what I mean? So now I'm not saying I want to eat because I don't like eating cannabis as much as I like the instant smoking, the instant effect. I like that instantaneous effect. Um, so... I feel like it's it's it, it satisfies me in the way because it's self it's just self reliant. Like I I have everything I need right in my kitchen just to quickly make up a dab, and it, I think it tastes great. I love it, and you know it's not you know and people who are hearing this who make dabs or smoke dabs are going to go oh god not the rosin you know because they're so they're so hard on it. But it's actually you know it's pretty damn good, and uh, you know I get to smoke the flavors I want to smoke instead of settling for some other strain that somebody else you know, did it with, and I get to smoke, you know, chem dog, you know, so, um, but as far as the image goes, you know, it doesn't look good, but it's definitely so mainstream now that I think that, uh, the public's perception of it's changing and it doesn't look as bad as it did three years ago. Um, as long as people don't blow up houses and continuously do that, which a lot of that's been going on, you know? Yeah. So, um, in terms of all the recent breeders kind of coming out of the woodworks, what's your feelings on this? And I guess more specifically, how do you feel about kind of companies using the ChemDog name as a way of, you know, trying to boost their product? You know, do you think it's like, you know, do you ever want to call these people out or do you just think like, look, at the end of the day, everyone's always going to try to say they've got like, you know, quote, the highest quality ingredients in their product and, you know, by the natural extension, people are going to lie and say that the chem dog is, the real chem dog's used in their strain when maybe it's not or, heck, I've even seen strains that don't even have chem dog in it and they've got like chem dog references in the name. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you know, yeah, there's some, there's some companies that have used that name and they've really done well with it you know you mentioned one earlier and i can think of one other one and uh when i first saw that when i first came out of the shadows and you know looked at an instagram or you know went to one of the weed carnivals as duke calls it you know i uh i was shocked i was blown away i was like oh my god i was like man these people will say anything they're just lying it's not even it's not even close to true and then the stories you know like when i you know, I got back on the internet in 2012, you know, you know, some people ask me that what, you know, some of the same questions you asked me about the Kimdog, and then they're like, that's not what I heard. And I'm like, dude, I'm telling you about my life, bro. What do you, what do you mean? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not repeating some story that I heard at somebody's house or whatever. I'm telling you what happened in my life, dude. This is to, to please understand that, you know? So 
I was really frustrated at first. And then when my friend showed me the picture on the package that was definitely my picture, I was like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, this is nuts. This is like a free-for-all. But, you know, and, it, and of course, it made me feel a certain kind of way. And it was like, you know, I was angry about it. I didn't like it. I was like, that's not right, man. I've put my fucking blood, sweat, and freedom on the line for this shit. I don't want to be fucking, you know, I don't want to see someone making trillion dollars off of a lie, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not really, it's not my mo to go around calling people out on their thing i like i said at, we'll all be sitting around you know at, at, at a table so to speak you know figuratively speaking and we all got stories and your stories either a bullshit lie or really are you really you really put your heart and soul into this and i put my heart and soul into this and i still to this day so like you know i don't like it but it's a waste of my energy to go around and police that or whatever you know what i mean like i i, I i'm just gonna you know what I want to when when you when you when you describe the situation you're talking about. The only answer is just to go blow blow them out of the water. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like you got the chem dog. No, you don't. Look at. It. I mean, how many times does that happen where you like you smoke a joint? And someone tells you the chem dog. And you're like, here, dudes, hit this instead. And they're like, what is this? And you're like, it's the chem dog, bro. You know, that's the chem dog. <laughs> I don't know why you just smoked me, but that's the chem dog. So that's kind of what I'm saying. Just like you know, do your thing, and make it make it happen. And and if you you just tell the truth, man. You know, like live 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 by the golden rule, and then you don't have to lie. You don't have to make up a fucking weird story for everyone to believe. You know, just you can just tell the people the truth if you lived your life the right way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it'll. I think in the end, it's all it's all going to sort itself out. Are those people crushing it? They are. They definitely are. Will they be crushing it in five years from now? I don't know. But, you know, I just think that, you know, I think that the truth at the, in the end of the day, you know, is, is what people are interested in. You know, they don't want to hear the bullshit lie. You know, I mean, there's some of these people we've talked about, you know, I mean, I'm not here to talk shit about anybody, but some of them, you know, some of them have, you know, they've fucking blatantly lied and known about it. And, and they've gotten really successful and like practically famous for some of the, you know, for their company, whatever their thing is, and their lie or whatever. And I think it just sorts itself out at the end of the day. You know, I really do. I think if you're a customer, say some dude in like, you know, Illinois and, you know, you want to get some seeds or something, are you going to go to the guy that's got a funny reputation for Hermes seeds and doesn't really, can't really tell you exactly where he got this, the, the, the stuff he says he got and, you know, I mean, or are you going to go where, you know, you definitely know this dude has, like, been doing this for whatever. You're probably going to, if you want the chem dog, you're going to go where you know the chem dog came from. You know what I mean? Yeah. I exactly. guess. Yeah, no, I no. think it'll all work itself out. Don't worry. People will. There'll be an exodus. Um, yeah, I think so. so. So this is uh, kind of our last extended response question. Then we've got just some kind of more short answer ones. Um, so it's a bit lighthearted. When when talking to people about ChemDog and all the different varieties, what do you find is the part that gets confused the most? Is it the fact that there's, you know, there's the D, the 3, the 4, the 91, and, and people just confuse the names? Or do you think, like, it's all the different aspects of the history which people confuse more so? Like, what, what do you find kind of I, – I, maybe it's not frustrating, but when you're trying to talk to people about it, what do you find gets kind of you have to correct the most? the volume of it. There's just so much bullshit that it's hard. It's almost tiring to hear it. You know, um, let me think, let me think about that for a second. I was just going to say, um, if you, if we actually look at Leafly at the moment, which is kind of, you know, the go-to website for people to look up strains, it says that chem 91 was a strain created from the original chem dog crossed to skunk. Uh, I mean, I, I understand that. Don't they have like a big joke about them saying that the, the sour diesel is an indica and, or hybrid and, and they say guys. it's a sativa and AJ is trying to get them to make it a hybrid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That kind of, so I guess they already are like kind of, then they're notable for getting things wrong. Yeah. So I feel like they're, they're gaining their own kind of reputation in a way they're kind of making their own reputation. They should probably check their sources. I remember, remember that, um, the can of Bible. Do you remember that book that was coming out of California? Yep. That was, Yep, yep. They had they had the chem dog story wrong in there, and I mean, we're, you're you're talking about a coffee table book you can pick up, and I mean, I'm looking at it right now. It's on my my fiance's. Uh, it's on her bookshelf right now, and and they got the chem dog story wrong. I think that it's. I think it's. It would have been more uh, useful if people would have taken their firsthand knowledge, 
and spread that around as opposed to the story they want to believe or the best version they heard or, or however they came to these things. I think it would have been more useful to the whole community if they would have just used the firsthand knowledge. And maybe now as we move forward and people can come out of the shadows a little bit more who actually, you know, um, know what's up, you know, that, that we're there, then maybe that will sort of fix itself too. But I, 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 I find it, it doesn't, it used to, it used to bother me more than it does now. Now to me, it's just like, it's more entertaining than anything. You're like, what? You know, <laughs> but it's, it's like, it's, it goes back to the truth is way more interesting than fiction. It always is. I mean, it's true. Like the best, craziest stories you've ever heard are true stories, you know? And it's the same thing. It's like, why, why do you got to make up a story? This, the original, the story, what actually happened. It's so mind blowingly interesting when you look at the different, the coincidences and the chance happening, the, the, the chance meetings and, and just like the, once in a lifetime events, you know, like how could that have even happened? That's so much more interesting than, you know, what everybody's opinion about this is. I can't tell you like how the, I felt when someone questioned my story. When I, when I finally told it to them, they asked me and they, and they, uh, they didn't question it like directly, but they were like, well, what I heard was this. And it's like, I just told you, like I said before, I just told you what happened. Why are you, why are you still telling me that version? And then my one of my favorite ones was when the the chem dog was being passed when that whole Joe Joe J, uh, Joe Brand thing happened and that fake chem dog that whatever that was it, to me I think it was a res dog sour diesel I think is what it was okay. but uh, it was a chunky sour diesel I saw a lot of it because like I said I had to go around and give a lot of bad news that summer and um, it, um what was I saying uh, oh you know. I would, I would, people that were, I don't want to say close to me, but people that were in my outer circles, you know, I would come in contact with them, people who I was, knew well enough to talk about this stuff with, they go, look, I got the chem dog, check it out. And then you go, this is not the chem dog. And then, then you have to give them a little bit of background about how you know that, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, this is the chem, I know this is not the chem dog because of A, B, and C, you know, like some of the things we've talked about. And then they still call it chem dog. <laughs> it's, like, it's like dude you literally got right from the horse's mouth we're told that this is not kim dog and but and for some reason i mean give it another name just name it something else now you know like make something up man you know what i mean like <laughs> but that's not the kim dog that was really that broke me down because those were some hard days for me because i'm telling you man like talk about units and where they got to go man like i i've always the chem dog has always been my thing so if there's some sort of confusion there man it, it really it hit me hard you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it was frustrating there was one point where i was like what do i even have this plan for you know what i mean am i let me i mean i know why i had it but as far as the other things are like you know besides smoking it and i was like what am i banging my head against this wall for if you know what i mean you know so but the other stories and stuff you know, I hear them and I, and I, and I try to try to see like where they got, how this story, you know, like when you're in kindergarten and you pass a secret around the room and the story's different when it gets back over here, I try to figure out how did that story get to be that way? And sometimes I'm like, I think someone just made this up. This sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. I don't know. <laughs> and it's always, always less interesting than the truth. There's no doubt about that. I haven't heard one story that was like, Wow. Let's just change the story to that. That's way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. So uh, for the last little bit, it's just some kind of lighthearted questions. So the first one being, um, if you could go to one place on earth at any time, you know, presumably to collect some land race seeds, where would you go and what era? Oh, the era. That would be hard. I would say... Um, I would say I would like to go to the Hindu Kush region in Afghanistan, the high the high mountains of Afghanistan, and and uh, um, and see what they had up there because that's that's my favorite. That's the cannabis that speaks to me the most. You know, I would have liked to have been. I there's a legend that uh, the skunk was found in in the wild. You know, in the Ohio River Valley somewhere in Kentucky or Ohio, and I would have loved to have been there when that happened. You know when. Um, not necessarily in the wild as the legend goes, but it, that it was, uh, that the people that, that had it, that passed it on, that's where they found it. And that, that they that the legend that they were going off was is that the native Americans there had been working with it and they, that it was a sacred plant to them. I would have loved uh -huh. to be there for that. 
it's yeah. been there just to witness that moment when that whole realization, you know, happened. And, and then when I look at the catalog and I see the man standing in the, you know, like bunker in front of all the hash and, and I'm looking around at him and I like, you got this white dude, you know, and, and he's like standing there with like these, you know, these, these soldiers, these warriors, you know, the family men, the warriors fighting the, 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 the Soviet empire. And somehow, some way, this guy gains enough trust to go and look at the big head stash, you know, and look at the spot where they're keeping all the hash, you know, that'd be, I mean, that's, I couldn't imagine a more powerful moment than that as far as cameras goes. I mean, that's just, that's some, that's some serious networking. That's before email. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's just like, how did that happen? That's amazing. What a contribution, you know? Yeah. I could only hope that um, one day I'd be able to chat to Neville about how that all happened and hopefully he'd share. Does anybody know where he's at? Yeah, he's um, he's currently in Australia, so not too far from me. But um, unfortunately, he's actually battling um, some cancer at the moment. So I'm not too confident he'd be kind of up to feeling up to doing an yeah. interview. But, um, you know, we obviously send our best wishes to him. Yeah, well, you know, I likewise out there for sure because to me that guy, uh, he, he made the biggest contribution to contemporary cannabis that there were, there won't be a bigger contributed contribution than that. You know, just collecting all that, working it, and, and, and giving it to the world in the, heat of, in the height of the drug war was just, I mean, thank you. You know, yeah. it was amazing. Yeah, he certainly, um, I mean, him and I think Shanti Barber has also done, you know, some comparable amount of work. But yeah, I think they definitely have done a lot, especially in terms of like just laying the groundwork for future people, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something to shoot for, you know, no doubt about it. Yep. So, on to our next question. This one, might, you might have to struggle about it because I think you might want to give more than one. But if you could only change one thing about the 91, what would it be? Uh, I would want it to go back. I, w- I would, it's lost. I, t- I talk in notes. It's lost a note or two on the flavor since I got it. I would like, there was this deep, dark, dark earthy flavor that, uh, you get it, but it's, uh, it's diminished somewhat. And I would like for that to come back. And, um, but overall without going back to something that maybe we've lost with it, um, I don't know. I would, it's hard for me to say cause it's, it's, you know, I would like it to be more, you know, chunky and, you know, the shape to be a little bit tighter on the tops and the edges, like we were talking about earlier. You know, yeah. I wish, the. I don't think it's the prettiest pot in the world. You know, I don't think it is. So I would say that, you know, I think that on, on all the things we judge cannabis on, I think that's probably gets more attention than it deserves the look of it you know yeah but um as opposed to the flavor and the smell and of course the drug traits but um i would say that that would be the one thing that i would want it to look look just look a little bit nicer you know like more shaped more shaped buds and and uh more uniform on that yeah okay so um when I'm, a, you- I'm a big i'm a big fan of the chem dog I, there's not it's, that's a tough <laughs> answer because i i really don't see how you can make something much more better than that you know yeah yeah i understand so um so when you do get the seed company up and running um i know that you've obviously got some own personal goals to get done have you however considered possibly doing a collab with someone have you ever thought like i'd love to get my own stuff going and then you know like duke's got some cool stuff going on maybe we could do a collab or something absolutely yeah uh duke's actually He's uh, he's really inspired me when it comes to the to the breeding. Like um, he's opened my eyes to the different um, possibilities with it, you know, and it's really kind of inspired me. So, yeah, I would certainly be interested in doing that. Absolutely, I think that those kinds of things are gonna. That's where the the real magic is gonna happen when people with their own views get together and make something like basically a new thing, you know. Like I, I think that's where a lot of the magic is gonna happen. I look forward to that, you know, as we go down the road here. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So what do you think are some of the most overhyped slash worst strains you've ever had slash, you know, biggest disappointments? Oh no, you're going to, you're going to hate the answer. The Chem D was definitely my, I don't really, I'm not impressed with that one. I'm just not, I don't get it. It, it is very medicinal. I will say I, uh, 
it's really good for anxiety. The, the people who are the patients that I'm in contact with, they, uh, Kim dog is, is, uh, Kim dog can actually, if, if you're, if you're not an everyday user, Kim dog can actually make your anxiety worse in the, in the short term. Um, it's just really strong. Um, but that the Kim, the Kim D I've noticed that the patients that I'm in contact with who have anxiety problems, which is, you know, you're talking 60% of the patients you come to, that's their, uh, understandably their main, their, their number one concern with their health, you know, as regards to cannabis is their anxiety. And that one really does seem to help because it's, I don't really know where it comes out on the THC scale. And of course, you know, I don't think the THC, like we were talking earlier, is the whole picture. I think it's the entourage. You know, you could have a strong THC and not have a real psychedelic type of cannabis, like say the can the chem dog can be to people. So I don't know how that's tied in, but for some reason, my feedback from people is that it's really good for anxiety. To me, it's just disappointing. I don't like that smell. You know, when you got people describing chem dog chem D smell as rotting meat garlic, it's like wood <laughs> so um yeah, yeah but, i've heard that then, description then, a lot yeah i'm just like i don't understand that one but um but then of course i smoke something that smells like you know fuel to people some people f- smell fuel and i don't really quite get that but i i kind of understand it but i i think that the fuel you know, characteristics that come from cannabis. I feel like the fuel, I think that kind of comes more from the name than an act. I don't really know if people smell diesel when they're smelling it. And I don't, I don't, I don't smell that, you know? So I guess it would be opinion thing, but as far as other strains that were really disappointing that I grew, they were mostly, they were mostly things that I'm not so sure they were what they, what they said they were. There was a master kush that I got. So I, and that was nothing good. And then, uh, you know, that cherry pie that I got, I liked it. I loved it, but it, it did. It put it put ball sacks out early in the flowering, and it was a problem for me. I didn't I didn't enjoy that, you know, because it. Um, I didn't really have much control over it, and going through with the style that I was growing, picking through that that was kind of tough. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't know. Some of my favorites that are outside of the chem dog family were like the super silver haze. I really enjoyed that one. And that was kind of out of my zone of what I like, you know, what I prefer in cannabis. That was kind of outside of it. And I still liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that as far as growers go that have been doing it as long as I've been, I feel like I've probably grown less strains than most of those people have, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the actual count of different strains I think is smaller mm-hmm. for me. We and won't hold it the, against you because you had the best weed on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, it's just, I, it's just what I'm into. I got lucky, you know what I mean. But so I, I didn't really have many. There's not many. There's definitely some that haven't met the cut. Like there's definitely been some, some that I felt like I had enough space enough to keep. But um, you know, we'll we'll see. I don't really have too many to say on that one, really. Yeah, the cool. Kim though. I really, I really don't love that one as much as people do, and I. I got to say, I really don't get it. And I'm not speaking bad about it. I'm hoping that it, it'll dawn on me at one point and I'm keeping it for breeding. Cause I, I think that there's, it does carry its traits to pretty heavy. And I've actually seen some crosses that were supposedly done with chem D that more chem dog notes came out of than say the chem D itself had. So I'm keeping it around, um, this time for, for that reason. Cause I want to see if we can work something out with it, you know, but yeah. that would be the one on that list for that answer. Okay, so would you ever consider um, putting out any feminized lines yourself? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna, like I was saying before, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go take both roads on this. I'm gonna do. Uh, I, 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 I was all about it, and then as I got more around the the breeders and the breeder, uh, uh, the, are the people who are are buying the stuff from the breeders and what their opinions are, and just kind of looking. I, I like I said, I got this negative. That I had this feeling that there was like a negative thing from the community on it but to me it's just to me it's just like you know i i you, you got to you know what i mean so I'm yeah gonna, i'm gonna check it out i think I for think, some people yeah, I think, a, sorry go on well i was just gonna say i think that you just have to do the proper testing and yeah i don't think i think when we started this interview i never finished that sentence i think what i've learned in this is that 
you can't just give seeds to people out and call that testing and get feedback. I think that that's useful, but maybe I'm wrong, but it might, I, I'm starting to get the feeling you got to do your own testing. Like if you really are looking for what you're looking for, you got to be the one looking for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, we certainly see that with uh, the likes of Brothers Grimm and Swamp Boy Seeds now doing all in-house testing. Um, just kind of uh, bringing us to that same point of what the people kind of want and talk about. We, we often hear this talk about people saying, you know, like we need to return to our land race roots. Do you have any um, kind of plans to to work with land races and say the chem dog, for example, or is your plans more so to kind of stay with um, more mainstream things and not necessarily looking to reinvent the wheel? Hmm. Definitely not looking to reinvent the wheel as long as, you know, I, I'm trying to, I want to see, I, I would like to have a catalog of, of things that are available that, that um, remind me of, of the strains that I smoked when I was a kid, the Nigerians and Af- the, the, the Afghan crosses and, um, you know, all those things that, that we were smoking out of the catalog when I was a young man. I, I, uh, I want to get all that variety of flavor back into it. I, I do think even with the highest, um, the highest quality strains that are out now, they're also some similar. They're also, from, you know, I mean, half of them are OG crosses, you know, the half of them are some sort of variation on the OG Kush, you know, and, and, uh, I think we need a little bit of more variety on that, on that, on that level of quality. If you know what I mean, not just yeah. more variety, but more variety on that level of quality. Where like instead of having Chem Dog and OG, or and whatever other ones that would fall into that category, maybe if we had another handful of flavors that you know, like a Skunk, you know, like I don't know a lot of people. I don't. I can't say. I can't say the last time I smoked a, a, a isolated Skunk strain you know like i really can't tell you the last time i really smoked a good quality one you know yeah and uh, i think it, there's i think it's like uh everything everything people keep running to one thing everyone runs to one thing at the same time all the time i think and, and so we keep getting we're, we're kind of running around in the same circle i think at this point you know we got all these different cushions and, and they're all great i mean they're, they're, and there are differences and, and same thing with the chem dog crosses that we've been making is that you know they're 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 very similar to the chem dog but they are different you know like the chem crush it's it's uh it's it it, it's funny because the thing i like about it is that it 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 does bring back that dark deep earthy tone it i do taste it in there and it really inspires me because i feel like hey this is possible those genes are there there's genetics they're still in there somewhere we just got to get them and isolate them and stabilize them you know and yeah. uh, and I feel like it can be done. You know, I feel like we have everything, you know, uh, everything at our, at our disposal to get this done. You know, so that's what I want. That's what I want to see. I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't think I don't think uh, I'm even able to. I think that I, I just want to uh, I want to do what I'm able to do. What I think I'm able to do is is to find those traits that I love that I think that everyone really loves and, and isolate them, you know, because I, I have a. The one thing I feel like I've got going for me in this in Dave year is that I have those memories. I have those memories of those smells and those flavors. I can tell the difference between the subtles of what we have now and the hints of those things and the actual thing. I can tell the difference. And it's kind of uh, I don't know. It's like reading or riding a bike or something. I can. It's in there. You know, like the Beatrix Choice, like I told you earlier. So um, that's what I want to do. That's what I think my would would most interesting to me. Not inter inter reinventing the wheel, but you know, bringing back the old school stuff. You know. Yeah, for sure. So, what's your opinions on um, organic versus synthetic? You know, I, I think you've kind of already hinted that you're uh, more of a bottled nutrient guy. Do you think it's just like a preference thing, or do you think one kind of is better than the other? I think that one is better for the other in certain environments if uh if in a perfect world everything i grew would be organic everything i eat's organic um you know i don't put funny products on my body and my on my head you know to, I'm, I'm i'm health conscious kind of person and um uh like i said i was the last person in my circles to to grow with bottled nutrients you know to even try it i was so against it i was like there's no plus i was having moderately at the time very good success at the time at uh, today's bar of what success is, I don't know because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put myself up against that. Um, 
but I think that when you're growing indoors and you're growing organic, you're still growing with bottle nutrients, aren't you? I mean, I don't see a lot of people like creating their own compost and bringing it in. And that's truly what organic growing is. When you're growing with organics, you're, you're not just using products that just came from the earth. I mean, they mine minerals out of caves in Jamaica, right? Uh, but they mine bat guano off the side of a cliff where bat, where, uh, I'm sorry, bird guano off the side of a cliff where birds migrate to, to breed, you know, themselves, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's destructive in a different way. So as I got older and my view of the world got a little bit bigger, I realized there wasn't much difference. The, the, the differences that I was holding on to weren't real. It wasn't like one was more ecologically conscious than the other. So then you're left with you, your, your own health, which one's healthier. And then after that, I would say that you're talking about flavors and variations in the quality of the product. And when you're growing indoors, the reality is, is that it's a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's a sprint. Things have to happen now. It moves quick. The plant's life cycle is extremely quick. And growing in organic indoors, it can be done. And, wow, you see people that have really good success with it. And then you see people, a lot of people growing it organic, and you're like, well, you think you're having a really good success at it, but honestly, this shit's burning my throat. And it tastes kind of harsh. <laughs> and, and I must be missing something because that's not what it was supposed to do. And um, so I think it's, like I said, if I'm growing in, a, in a, if I was doing a light depth, it would be organic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the, and it would be for various reasons. One, one being because I can, I can bring compost into that situation. The other reason is because you know, actually, growing organic on a large scale, I think is is actually more cost effective. You know. Um, yeah, I certainly think so in terms of the cost effectiveness on larger scales. Yeah, so I think that when you're controlling the environment like you are in an indoor grow room where you have complete control over everything, air, light, water, and food. I think you're, you have to be realistic about the plant's demands, which are going to be, I know this doesn't make sense. They're going to be higher in, on the indoor situation as far as like potential goes, in my opinion. And there's plenty of people who are going to disagree with this, but I think your potential is higher. And that you have, you're with as far as what you're feeding your plants, you're really just playing catch up to what everything else is providing. You know, no, the sun's not. The sun is way brighter than your grow lights, but this the sun's not sitting right over top of the plant. It's perfect situation all all day long either. You know what I mean? It's, there's a lot more variations. The temperature is always the same. So, yeah. the potential, in my opinion, for quality is higher. So you're really just trying to keep up with that potential when it comes to what you're feeding your plants. And and then going back to the fact that I, I personally don't think you're really growing organic unless you're, you know, you're making compost and, and you know, like I used to grow in, in peat moss with organic, my, my, the vat, like I was telling you earlier, but that's really hydroponic growing. You know, that soil is a, is a lifeless medium, you know, and I'm feeding a little life into it every, every once in a while, but. You know, I don't know. It, it, it was amazing. I mean, it, it, the quality was amazing. And I, I, often ask myself why don't you give that a shot but you know the life life moves at the speed of light around here in california and you're kind of just doing what you do and i really like the product that i come up with it's super smooth and 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 high flavor and it gives me everything i want so but i i definitely want to check it out i want to experiment a little bit more and bring back some of those old methods i had and take what I know now and apply it and see what else I can come up with. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. And so, uh, on to the next question, uh, kind of tying into that, what would be kind of the biggest mistake you see people making in growing or maybe another way to put it would be, what would be your tip for people growing? You know, do you, you know, for example, Dukes, he always sees people over watering. What's your kind of take on things? Well, Let's see. I, one thing I see a lot of is that when people find a problem, they come at it like they're they bum rush it, you know, like they and then and at the end, at the problem might get solved, but they didn't learn anything. You, you could come at a problem with like an arsenal of, of things and methods and try this and that. I mean, there's all kinds of shit people try. I mean, it blows me away. People make sprays out of tobacco for God's sakes. I mean, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds ludicrous to me. So and, and instead of just take your time, do your research, think about what you're doing, 
and, and, and like try to stay on point with the problem. Don't just try to come out with everything because if it happens again, guess what? You're going to have to come out with everything because you don't know what you actually did to fix it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I would say that that would be the, the thing I see that happens the most is that people panic when there's something goes wrong. And instead of just taking their time and just breaking it apart, plan ahead, make sure you're not going to hurt, lose, you know, like a strain or something like that, like a genetic or something, but, you know, figure out what the problem is and fix it. And then, then if it ever happens again, you can just fix it, you know? So that's what I would say about that. Yeah. But spe- specifically, I think you wanted mo- something more specific. Specifically, I think people overfeed their plants way too much. Organic or otherwise, I, I see people like just throwing money down the drain, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I see that a lot as well, actually. Um, so, what, in your opinion, is the worst thing to happen to the American cannabis community uh, since the medicalization happened? So, like, one example would be um, kind of the new laws being proposed in California. You know, you'd be well aware of this. You know, a lot of people are kind of saying that they're a step back in a lot of ways, you know. What is your? What do you think is the worst thing to happen since legalization? Mm. Worst thing that's happened since the medical legalization. Mm. Well, I I don't like how. Um, let me think for a second on that. How to put this? I don't like how the the grower, the small time grower, is just pushed around. You know, as far as like what the what the product goes to market for. I really think that that it's unfortunate that the person who's producing the product that everyone's, you know, interested in right now is the one that, you know, oftentimes is the one that's working the hardest to make a living. And I think that it's, there's a lot of factors that have caused that. And I that think that's the worst part. You know, I think that I wish that we were lived in a situation where growers could kind of, uh, unionize or create like uh, associations where we agree on you know what's fair and what's not fair for all of us, and then and then apply that to the market. You know, I wish that there was more of that, and I think that you know you basically got growers competing with each other trying to get their product to market, and you know everyone who came to the cannabis industry lately has taken a huge advantage of that, and. You know, I've watched families, you know, struggle for years on end doing what they want to do. And I feel like with all the risks they take and and the um, and all the work, I mean, it's a lot of work. You know this. I mean, anyone listening to this knows that it's a lot of work growing cannabis. There's no, nothing easy about it. It's a lot of work, you know. If you want it to come out right, it's a lot of work. And I see families that, you know, good good people, good families that work really hard and they struggle because they're they're at the mercy of this of this dynamic in the market where it's like, I'm not saying that, you know, cannabis should be priced at this or whatever like that. I'm just saying that they have no control over it. And I think that's unfortunate. And at the end of the season or, you know, yeah, at the end of the season, especially because those are the ones that really get hit, you know, they end up competing with each other like in a cutthroat manner. And I, and I think legalization had a lot to do with that. And I'm not really sure why, but it definitely seemed to have gone hand in hand. It's got, to do with the dispensaries, but it also has to do with the fact that everything's more on top of the table now, so it's easier for people to take advantage of that, you know, so. Yeah, to, like, shop around for the best prices and everyone has to sell for less. Yeah, just so they can feed their families and keep the lights on, you know what I mean, and keep the, keep the roof over their head. And I just, I don't like that. It bums me out. But, I mean, I guess everything in life's like that, I guess, you know, so. Yeah, that certainly does seem like a negative. Um, so kind of bringing us to our last question, um, what do you think is the best way for a kind of emerging cannabis medical community to develop? You know, Do you think that we shouldn't go gun-ho on trying to legalize everything? Do you think, you know, well, what would be your advice? Just, you know, take things slow, look to find the best clones first. You know, I mean, there's a whole variety of answers. I think that, I think the whole term medical is kind of, I think it's kind of a, uh, it implies something that we got to be careful with because when you start talking, going back to the, <clears throat> here in the United States, the DEA, um, the DEA deciding to keep cannabis as a Schedule One drug. On the flip side of that, if they, ch- if they chose to keep that as a Schedule Two drug, right, with medical benefit, well, that sounds rosy. That sounds great. That's what we always wanted. 
the problem with that is, is that all that really means is that, and this is the United States, of course, you know, um, but all that really means is that the DEA can give universities, research institutes, basically pharmaceutical companies, permission to work with cannabis to research it so they can develop their own products, right? So it's a the medical thing itself is still kind of an iffy thing because if you start if we start touting this is actual medicine, well, I mean, I'm not allowed to make Tylenol in my house. I'm not allowed to make oxycodone or or statin drugs in my house. There's a company that's only allowed to do that, and they're allowed to do that because the DEA gives them permission to do that. So we have to be careful with that because, you know, that's in one way it's an open door. It's also another door that can close on us pretty quickly. You know what I mean? If we're not careful and they could say, whoa, buddy, I mean, you know, whiskey's easy to get, but you're not allowed to make that. And if you are, you certainly are not allowed to sell it. You know what I mean? You got to be very careful if you decide to make that. And I know we're talking about two different things, but I'm, but but um, as far as medical, I mean, whiskey's not a medical or anything, but it's the same. It's regulated in the same way. Only certain people who've gone through certain hoops can produce something like whiskey or oxycodone or statin drugs or whatever they are that they give people. You know, so it's a it's a it's a dicey thing. I mean, it's definitely a back door. It's like I used to always tell people, it's like they kept the front door closed for so long and medical marijuana is just us coming through the back door. Now we're just in the living room. What are we going to do now? But, you know, that door can be closed too based on the term medical, you know. So cannabis is a plant and and it definitely gives people benefits. And um, I, I wish that instead of trying to isolate, okay, what does cannabis help people with? And, and I wish that society would just accept that cannabis just over helps people overall with their help, health. You know what I mean? In many different ways. There's not one particular way. So, you know, it's kind of like um, um, what would be another thing like that? I mean, you know, we all agree that vitamin C is good for us or that's not really good. But like eating fruits and vegetables is it's a, it can, the same thing. Oh, it's a good thing. It's healthy for you. Some people yeah. juice vegetables to cure cancer. Some people, you know, consume mass amounts of CBD and have, you know, uh, cured cancer. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're not going to start regulating, you know, cold-pressed vegetable juice just because it gives some great benefits. They're not going to start regulating that like alcohol or tobacco or anything. So, you know, it's got to be careful because we're inviting – I think that we don't have no choice that regulation's coming – and it's going to be really unfair. There's going to be, uh, in some aspects, there's going to be winners and losers. And I, I wish that we could get around that and just legalize it as a plant and say, hey, you know what? We have you go around the farmers market, you can buy some broccoli. The guy next door's got some cannabis for sale. I wish it could be like that, but I know it's not going to be because we've already gone so far down this road. And uh, and so that's about it. I think medical, you got to be careful with it. It's a double edged sword. You know, I think yeah. not now today it's rosy, but I think in a few years they can shut the door again on us if they want, if they give it all to the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Okay. So I think that that, um, kind of brings us to the end of things. Actually, was there any shout outs or general comments you wanted to make? No, not really. I can't imagine it was, uh, this was, this went pretty good and this is good to talk to you and appreciate it. Awesome. So, um, yeah, everyone needs to keep their eye out for, I think you said early next year, they'll be able to get their hands on some chem crush, was it? Uh, that's, 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 that's definitely one of them. That's kind of just something I'm finding along the way onto the end goal. Um, the thing the the vision is, is when I, when the release happens, there's going to be four or five decent hybrids, uh, with strains that people are already probably in love with. And, um, and then what I, and across with the chem dog male that I've developed that I really feel like I can stand behind. That's pretty much what it's going to be. So, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, things have sped up a lot quicker than I thought. Like I, I got into this a little late. I decided to do some of these things a little late and, uh, and I got a little lucky. I think I jumped ahead a little further with some luck. So yeah, maybe January or February, I think we might actually have some December at the earliest. I would, I was hoping for December at the Emerald cup. In Sonoma County, but uh, we'll see probably sometime in early next year. Awesome. Well, everyone needs to keep their eyes out there uh, for that. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and chat with us, Skunk VA. Yeah, come check out the Instagram. We got the Skunk underscore VA, you know, with the at sign in front of it, and you can see some yep. pictures of what we're what we're doing as we're going along here. 
You see some awesome Chem 91 photos. All right, Absolutely. thanks so much. So there you have it. Thanks so much again to our guest, Skunk VA. Keep an eye out for Lucky Dog Seeds and 420 Australia. See ya.